today in the first day of Congress of Culture in Lviv, we invite you for the uh, discussion called Post-Catastrophic Memory Ethics in, uh, in Museum Space. We are here now in those decorations, which are not actually even decoration. It's a setting which really suits our today's talk and uh, also quite suits the post-catastrophic um, feeling of life. All my interlocutors represent institutions of uh, memory, so I'm going to accent and focus on that part of their professional identity about everything else you can read on the page of the Congress. Uh, so today with us uh, we have Anton Drobovich, head of Ukrainian Institute of National Memory, Mikhailo Zubar, uh, representative of Development Department uh, of National Taras Shevchenko Museum, Igor Pashavailo, CEO of um, Memorial Complex of Heavenly Southend Museum of Dignity Revolution Maidan Museum, and Hrastina Rutar, uh, the researcher of ter Territory of Terror um, the Researcher Museum. And my name is Rena Storovoit. I'm going to be a moderator of this discussion. Today we gathered here to talk about the world which uh, is falling into abyss, but then uh, survives. And not only life continues, but also narration does the uh, speech continues and maybe from time to time we need to take into account this apocalyptic potential of historic of circumstances and situations to understand how to live and develop further there is a long shadow of our long past in our present there are some uh, precaution signs warning signs what happened may may can we could could not have happened because history studies, uh, studies tells us not only about disruptions but also about overcoming of this. People who have something to do with trauma, with catastrophe, have to focus their attention on what we definitely want to get rid of, to uh, um, to omit. And uh, in this case, our connection with our discussion with future is the fear about future fear not of somebody or of something, but fear for somebody and for something. We could have called it um, the care, care about present. Uh, and now I would like to ask the first um, introductory uh, question to our interlocutors and ask them to reflect them uh, one, uh, uh, one by one. So. Uh, we were going to talk about how local one is happening when world is looking at Ukraine. World is looking at Ukraine and how we are trying in a new way activate our past um, catastrophes. Uh, Holodomor, Holo 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 Holocaust, deportation of Crimea people, Chernobyl, Maidan and uh, new war. Uh, so my question is the following. Uh, how do we need to form and uh, narratives and stories about catastrophes of past and even the present, which are uh, very crucial for a collective identity and how uh, it defines our vulnerable sensitivity. Because if we talk about catastrophes, especially if those catastrophes are man-made, um, how uh, we can uh, form, reformat our uh, f per perception of boundaries of cultural, political, and social um, um, and, and social abuse. First of all, thank you for this, for such opportunity for such topics that we are discussing today. Because, um, in fact, catastrophe is pretty wide notion and concept, and probably not all events are easily accommodated to this term. Uh, in the previous session, we analyzed very well different approaches, uh, modern trends, modern concepts uh, in wide world uh, plan, if to talk in a more specific way. Because if we, if we talk about catastrophic events or events uh, of so-called difficult history and about the traumatic experience that they uh, gave to us Ukrainians, uh, as society, as nation, then I'm going to talk more about Maidan. And it is well-known fact, and we talk about interpretation here more, about um, 
attitude to catastrophes and presentation of the stories of those narratives to wide audience in museum uh, environment. And today this topic is very painful not only for Ukraine, all the whole world, is, at least museum uh, environment, is in reinterpretation process. Uh, in particular, the most topical uh, themes are wars, of course, First and Second World Wars, uh, Great War, as the First World War is often called in, a in Europe, Holocaust, of course, uh, man-made catastrophes of the global scale, and of course, modern wars. In this context, we understand that museum uh, environment uh, are very actively and effectively form this modern narrative. They help to form an attitude of modern uh, people and next generations to this or that event. And we know that there is a so-called fight of memories. We had lots of uh, projects in Ukraine, uh, in, particular, uh, in particular supported by uh, UCP. Uh, and my um, my experience of creating this um, museum of revolution of dignity we see that memory is very uh, very flexible it's uh, it can be formed in both negative and uh, positive uh, type uh, this fight of uh, memories happens on different levels on individual level group level uh, national uh, world level and here in the museum of the memorial we have those platforms which really have huge potential to change those traumatic dark stories into positive experience and we have also talked about this in the previous um, session my uh, colleague Fiona Cameron once mentioned about the paradox that modern society which requires reinterpretation of a difficult story, a diff different history in museums, usually try to sanitize, uh, glorify catastrophes, make them look better. So people uh, already in, uh, ask museums to show plura pluralistic approach to difficult history, to give the possibility to interpret and discuss difficult topics on the one hand, but at the same time, visitors of modern Western museums need, uh, according to social, sociological research um, conducted by Western Museum, they need social orientations. They need museums to be a pillar for them to help them be, to, to be better oriented in social behavior of these or that catastrophic events. That's why we have this paradox. And in reality, lots of museums, especially uh, Soviet, post-Soviet, uh, they uh, were trying to, uh, they, were, they were giving their own narrative. They were more like tools of ideology, of propaganda. Right now, Ukraine is in very catharsis uh, situation. We have talked about catharsis, cataclysm, and catastrophe in a previous session. When we have the possibility, you know, in a way to change this approach that is in trend in Western museums currently. So f we need to move from glorification, from uh, trying to condemn uh, political ideology and the trauma that was given to society and certain groups to more to, to a more detailed environments so, so visitors can objectively understand the context of these or that events and make their own conclusions. So that's why this balance, this happy medium is in a way between leadership in modern cultural institutions, museum complexes, for them to be platforms for critical rethinking of history. The platforms which will help to conduct constructive dialogue and talk about difficult history, not with the aim of uh, deepening of the trauma, but with the aim of consolidation of society, 
the aim of discussing of painful and sometimes forbidden topics with what uh, for the society to gather and talking about those traumatic events talking through those events we can move forward also it was difficult diff um, interesting idea in the previous session the dialogue is not always uh, consent is not always a result of dialogue uh, the possibility to hear and understand each other is the main result of the dialogue hello everybody thank you for invitation traditionally i would like to immediately, I immediately would like to mention that it will be pretty difficult for us to discuss because we uh, are on the same we have more or less the same positions with all my colleagues but first of all i would like to mention that if we talk about post-catastrophic uh, ethics in our museum environment about our local history then uh, we do not have that much experience in discussing catastrophes and uh, post-catastrophic experience uh, in the previous session we had such an opinion that we are a very positive nation and we are uh, directed into future and it's if to talk if to look at our history at our events at our museum uh, exhibitions uh, through those um, to look at to look at life then we can make a conclusion that we did not have that many catastrophes because we already discussed with my colleagues I'm I'm sorry maybe I am uh, taking a little bit of uh, your time and your uh, ideas but we do not have so many uh, museums we have catastrophe we have Chernobyl catastrophe museum we have museum Holodomor museum yes it is building it is developing uh, it's a pity that we are not going to uh, hear the opinion of the director of this museum but uh, everything else cannot be called the experience of discussing catastrophes because as a previous speaker has mentioned we have uh, this experience of glorification which is uh, post-colonial post-soviet if we talk about uh, the second world war the first world war is not very well discussed in our environment that's if to talk about global national level but i would like to separately uh, go down to more local story history if we take uh, our museum infrastructure it is not uh, only about national careful view museum or Kharkiv museum in fact in every city in every region there is its own museum and we can talk we can say that in every part of our country we have our local catastrophe it was there and it will be there and i would like to stop on that to focus on that I would like to talk about three things if to if we talk about museum as uh, social moderators as institutions that form a social dialogue in my opinion our museums are not uh, full-fledgedly like that we can also discuss about that and uh, talk three things are important here First one is for capability it's for, for, to, be, to be able to discuss those catastrophes, those traumas. First one is the choice of topics by museums, the possibility to choose topics on, um, for, uh, for their own, their own, to reflect, to communicate with them. Uh, and uh, it's about local, um, local communities for which those um, museums exist and the music musification of those topics it's also very important on the basis of which in the future it uh, this uh, discussion is going this uh, this broadcasting of this um, topics are going to happen and the third uh, point is the possibility to translate um, the topics in modern conditions the first one it seems to me that we that museums museums need to remember especially if we talk about local museums that as i have mentioned every part of our country every local uh, place uh, has its uh, populated area has its has or had its own catastrophe local catastrophe and uh, there is uh, or there, there is a memory or there is no memory about this catastrophe and we need to remember that something that, that might seem as a catastrophe for somebody for somebody else might not be a catastrophe at all if we do not talk about 
let us uh, political questions. It's the, the, the bright question, bright example here, the industrialization uh, for monocities of east part of Ukraine. Uh, it's a global catastrophe in the framework of these cities. For non-industrial or absolutely purely industrial, it may not be a catastrophe at all. It can be even an advantage for them if we talk about ecology or musification. We need to remember about that and we need to talk about that. Museum employees should remember about that. Those people who, those opinion makers should remember about that, those institutions which are direct, uh, directed towards discussion. The second one is basis of music, musification, what we are talking about. We always need to remember that for us of now, we practically do not deal with musification of our current story, uh, history. I do not like uh, generalize, generalizing, but now I need to do this. We have uh, such uh, we have such a saying: uh, tomorrow, today uh, will be uh, yesterday. Uh, so uh, we need to think what uh, local museums are going to do in, let's say, 50 years. How they are going to represent 1990s, 2000s? Uh, whether they are going to talk about pandemic and COVID-19 or some other global or local catastrophes. And the third one, and as for me, the most important point is the translation, is broadcasting. It's some kind of uh, dialogue through with uh, visitors, through exhibitions, through collections, through objects of research. How we are going to talk about this? How we are going to communicate? We already see now that this didactic manner in which majority of our museum uh, employees uh, uh, was educated on is a for me is not effective. It does not work in postmodernistic society. Or, um, and as Ihor has mentioned, museums need to have dialogue, to have feedback. By the way, in Western world, as, uh, theoretics of museum studies in the middle of the 20th century already started talking about feedback as a very important uh, a chain uh, in the dialogue, uh, and at least uh, for museum employees, those senses, those codes, those symbols, or that set of information, a form of information provision, uh, should be understandable for visitors because very often we live in our own bubble and we do not understand very well. It seems to us that we are deep in the topic, we research it actively and we try to give the visitor as much information as possible. But uh, today this information may not be even read, uh, not be even understood by a visitor because it is understood based on um, cultural level and symbolic thinking or not thinking. And museums uh, really need this communication and feedback with visitors because uh, we can uh, we have an example of Kenneth Hudson here who was writing about the case of, an, if I'm not mistaken, natural museum in Brussels. One, one and the same visitor always came there and when he was asked after the sixth time or the fifth time, so you, do you really like our, ex our exhibition so much? No, I don't really like it, but I really like how molecules look like. But the person always went there and museum employees thought that everything is understandable for him and he needs to, uh, he wants to get more and more information. So about, we need to remember about such topics, we need to talk about this. It's like those three main important uh, topics and communicatively we have to be ready to transform and rebuild uh, ourselves to exist and work effectively and to become opinion makers and institutions of uh, sustainable development. 
I would like to refocus and make our key question a little bit sharpen, sharper. So giving the floor to our uh, to other speakers, I would like to um, get add one more point here. It's a well-known fact that in the end of 70s and the beginning of the 80s in the Western world, at the beginning of 80s and the beginning of the 90s in the so-called Second World, to which the Soviet Union depend, uh, belonged and uh, the Soviet Ukraine, we had some kind of diversification of senses in museums uh, concerning narratives in history. Uh, on the one hand, um, the, uh, the government, the state, lost part of power um, and and the second, secondly, it lost part of authority and monopoly on history, whether it was good or not, or what should be considered good or what shouldn't be uh, considered so, and what should be considered as catastrophic. And the third important thing is that it also lost part of um, responsibilities because there was a need, there, there began, um, there was this need of diversified voices uh, that do not only show position of those who survived, but also position of victims, of those who cannot talk about themselves anymore. And maybe in the second part of our introduction, I would like to focus more on this, and I am giving the floor to Anton. Thank you. First of all, I would like to reflect uh, generally about the topic of our panel. It is a very uh, nice uh, topic that we have here, post-catastrophic. So what is, uh, what is post-catastrophic ethic? What is post-catastrophic ethic of uh, uh, memory and post-catastrophic ethic of memory in museum environment? It's a very... Um, exquisite uh, title for those people uh, maybe some um, more people are watching us online because it's very specific but it's really marvelous topic uh, that kind of uh, gives us hint that what we can let ourselves do and think about that but i would like to st to still talk about several uh, words from this title in more details because the same as uh, when you think about something it's a luxury but to have museums concerning some kind of specific um, phenomenons, phenomen phenomenons and concepts it's a luxury we do not have a museum for every point in our history it's a very uh, very expensive um, a deal. We do not have museum for every topic, and the same is in the world. Uh, it's very expensive, and those who work in uh, modern museum sphere, they know that it's uh, ex the exhibition costs millions of dollars of the modern museum. Yes, there are some al alternatively gifted people in department, and they think that three f three uh, rooms is enough uh, with this. Uh, kind of still Soviet attitude, but it's very expensive in reality. And why, it is expen why is it expensive? Why do we have the need for museums? Here I would like to refer to um, uh, Mr. Gillian, who was talking at inspirational uh, panel. It's about our re relations to reality. For certain things, we do not have video or book narratives or even plays. For some things, we want to put them into the space. We want to put things into the space, things that scream, that whisper, or talk about reality of these or those events. Narratives are built in this uh, in, in the sphere. In postmodern time, lots of people get rid of objects, but still there is a, a magic and power of of a place and of, of objects. The same is about place. It's very important to use um, a story for. Um, museum. It's very important way of a different way of communication with past and different way of uh, showing uh, past in our reality. It actually gives us um, it uh, helps us to think about reality because in Latin, res reality is eternity. Something is real because it's tangible. We can uh, we can attach. Uh, a table or your colleague and if you put um, the this this the shelf uh, which was on fire from religion and dignity even you can already understand and feel something towards it even if you did not read the uh, definition 
So I do not believe that uh, that it's so easy to consolidate with memory and that the re consolidation is possible there at all. Of course, there is, de there is definitely can be consolidation in uh, knowledge and in feeling. It uh, does not mean that everybody is going to feel um, in the same way or uh, have all the same uh, knowledge, but there can be field of senses, of common senses. So you need to uh, find common ground and reality, yes? Yes, you can uh, get this with the help of education, uh, science, public discussions in the public uh, space and through projects of cultural institutions. Uh, it is the first remark that I would like to uh, to tell. And the first is museums. I absolutely agree with the position that uh, I think that we do not have space, mu museum space in Ukraine that shows not only consensus, uh, that, that, sh uh, that does not show, not, e not, not consensus, but even some kind of narrative of catastrophes of the world level. There are some attempts, great attempts in Lviv, in Kyiv, in Kharkiv, in Odessa. There are attempts to build narrations uh, about these catastrophes. Those attempts are valuable because in those efforts, people are born who are ready to, who are able to formulate certain narratives. They are able to create this intellectual product, but it's still not finished product. We do not have uh, museums at world level. We have uh, some kind of outdated ex um, exhibitions uh, and attempts of building modern museums. And it's a great luxury that our state uh, lets itself about ethics of memory, uh, several words about this. What is ethos? In a, a, a Greek, um, ancient Greece, uh, it's a habit. So habitual memory, uh, remembering. So basically, you take Homo Sovieticus and you ask, what can you tell about the Second World War? You went there, we won. Uh, so you uh, ask 100 person, and they will tell more or less the same thing. It's ethos of memory. It's heroic, as Ihor has already mentioned, because uh, it was uh, like this in the Soviet Union. Now we rethink it, and we try to show that there were people in occupation. It was a tragedy of Holocaust during this. It was a tragedy of people who were kept captive. Uh, who are captivated, and then as uh, the Soviet Union told that uh, they were not uh, in uh, captivity, but they were in concentrated camps. The, sec the museum of the Second World War in Kyiv tries to open this topic, whether they are very successful in it uh, now, but they still try. So ethos is not just an object of social agreement that we uh, discussed and that we had, but it's uh, process, long-lasting process of social consent. That's how it becomes custom. And this custom of talking through and of remembering helps to heal wounds. It becomes the source of norms. That's about your second question about, uh, concerning working on uh, problems of the past and our sensitivity. What can it give us? So first of all, very important thing, we recognize if we see, if you talk through very well traumas of past, we try, we start recognizing uh, signals, uh, anxiety signals in our society, and we can warn ourselves and our children, and that's your clarifying question to think about future, from those uh, signals. You see that, for example, there is populism happening, people are divided in some principles, but the second thing that we can do is escape. We can run away from evil. If we uh, understand it well, we can try to move to something opposite. And the last thing that I would like to mention, it's just for, it's just ground for thoughts, why it's 30, why we have 30 years, but we do not have even one uh, world-level museum it's about not even one catastrophe that we had in the 20th century. Yes, we are young democracy, that's true. I'm also optimistic like that, but take Israel. 1948, that was the date of the creation of Israel. Take 30 years. It also was in very difficult conditions. Everybody knows about that. You, 
if you take 30 years, it's 1978. How many wars uh, Israel won during that time? And Israel built Yad Vashem during that time. The first version was built in 1950s. But the first version of Holodomor is built. Yes, but here it will, idea will be ideal here. Yes, because Yad Vashem is from 1978, it's not Yad Vashem that you know right now. No, the one we know like this, it was built in 2005. But uh, Yad Vashem that you know in 2001, uh, take away uh, uh, Bruno Schulz's uh, frescas. Um, yes, but still, you see, that's already becoming a discussion. It's turning into a discussion. I knew that it would be a trigger. And the last thing, it's about silence. What does this 30 years silence can mean? Uh, for on the one hand, that we worked really well in literature, in science, and theater, we have all of this, and we now have this richness of museum exhibits. But on the other hand, I was thinking, silence, what can the silence mean? It can mean uh, that you, uh, you don't care about something, it can mean that you are shocked, it can mean that you think something through. Uh, Reutberg, when Reutberg was um, writing, he was in silence, so he was keeping quiet. Silent can mean also uh, some kind of uh, specific conspiracy. Why, do not, why we do not have the museum that we would like to have? of Holodomor, of Holocaust, of the Second World War, of deportation, of Chernobyl, of and so on and so forth. The one that we would like to have, and that we would, li we would like to see those museums. This requires for intellectual re-foundation, and that's not fair to give the floor to Christina, but the Museum of the Terror Territory, which she represents, is part of the answer to this question, so uh, I'm wholeheartedly giving the floor to Christina. I would just add that this is a wonderful part and I'm proud that we have a municipal museum of this type. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be in this company to discuss this complicated and challenging topic. I was thinking about the ethics of memory. Thank you to the other panelists for not mentioning what I'm going to say. I'm going to, wish to speak about Vishay Marshali, who uh, in uh, in their book uh, mentioned that it's the duty of a man to remember but it's up for debate of what we are to remember and how we are to remember so I will be speaking about very specific things not something abstract the territory of terror museum has its mission of working with two complicated topics the Nazi occupation, the trauma of this occupation, the Holocaust trauma, and the second topic is the trauma of the Soviet memory. The European topic is based on the topic of Holocaust, and we are to work with another very serious trauma. We want for everything to be completed on the 30th year of our anniversary, but we realize that the silence uh, that was everywhere when Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union was caused by fear. And now when we are implementing our historical project, we are again facing fear from people. They are afraid to talk about these things. They refuse to talk. And even when they agree to meet us, they can uh, refuse the last minute uh, being afraid that somebody can find out about the information they can share but on the other hand we have people who have already conducted some research and who were uh, trying to discover uh, some information about their parents who were either murdered deported or exiled and they just rewrite documents from archives so trying to reflect on what uh, my colleagues have already said about museums working with uh, social memory we are working with compartmentalized memory our task is to make it into a single memory 
we are not to create a narrative here, but we should allow for various narratives to be present. We should allow for the witnesses to tell their stories by themselves, and we are not trying to give any additional explanation of how people should perceive such stories. Of course, we are assuming some kind of power, because we talk only to those people who are willing to share their story and we are presenting only parts of their stories. So we are, in a certain sense, constructing this narrative, making it more comprehensive. The other thing about talking through the topics of catastrophes and trauma, this is uh, lesson number one for trauma. For you to be healed of this collective trauma, you need to talk through it, you need to narrate it and verbalize it. And when the person has already left the circumstances, it's possible to achieve, but now it's become more complicated with uh, the war uh, in the east of Ukraine. We are facing a war again. So discussing the war and Holocaust and post-war repressions and deportations are possible to talk about, unlike the war. But uh, the difficulty is that some people uh, are already dead, they passed away, and we can no longer hear their story. And there is part of those who have the memory but are not willing to share it. When we are trying to narrate the trauma, to tell it within our limited museum space, we have to be very careful so as not to re-traumatize the person sharing the story as well as those listening to that story, uh, the visitors of the museum. We can look at the example of other countries in this respect, but we need to remember the specifics of our country, local specifics uh, of Ukraine in particular. The transfer of memory is also important for a person who has already had this trauma uh, and if they have passed away, the memory, the memories are kept within uh, their family. So the descendants, they are important for us and it is important for them to tell the story in the way it was told to them by their mother or grandmother. And it's quite complicated because these are not abstract things but the fates of uh, real people. So. There is a story of a person and they remember it in a specific way, but we understand that the story that you heard from somebody else is also valuable and we are ready to record it. So please share it for this story to become part of our shared memory. In this respect, mediators are very important. Not a supervisor, but a mediator a person uh, who is open to leading uh, the storyteller and telling them that you can become part of the exhibition and in the future. And here there might be another question of education, of having enough qualified staff. Where do we find this? person, this mediator, who is uh, ready to work with the topics of Holocaust, Gulag, and trauma. So this is another challenge, uh, quite complicated one at that. And when we say that our museum uh, is to work with the topics of Holocaust and Gulag, provisionally, the Soviet trauma on the one hand, and the Nazi trauma, the Nazi occupation trauma, will it be something uh, understandable? Will the two topics be understandable for all the visitors of our museums? Those who come uh, to our museums as the former ghetto territory, but also for the visitors who represent another target audience. Will it be understandable? Will it be a shared experience that we remember both catastrophes, that uh, we raise both complicated topics? 
And that is when we have the memory and empathy if we realize the equal importance of both topics. Uh, for now, I don't have the answer to this question. I can add from myself remembering both stories or even three stories. This is challenging and relevant and there is no solution to this problem, not just in Ukraine. Uh, in the early uh, 2010s, I was in Minsk, the newly built uh, museum of the uh, Great War, which had uh, the flag of the Soviet Union and we can often have in a chronic museums and that is the example of such a museum and in Soviet Union museums very often uh, raise concerns uh, from their visitors because there was official story official history in the Soviet Union and the unofficial Soviet Union, which was often dubbed as anti-Soviet. Sometimes it was passed within families, even in the form of uh, size, some pictures representing the alternative past, which could have turned into alternative future. And that was the case for many families. And when we think about the functions of museum, we need to think about the functions of existing societal memory because if we look at the example of Holodomor Museum, which is not probably the best museum, the fact is that we don't have the lacuna in our societal memory. In November, even small kids uh, burn a candle in memory of the Holocaust victims, of the Holodomor victims. So this is a newly tra established tradition that has already taken roots. So the stories written uh, by the British journalist uh, who shed light on the events of Holodomor were enough uh, for Mays who came back to independent Ukraine to say that Ukraine needed to reinvent its memory about the Holocaust. So museums dedicated to catastrophes are significant. What we should be concerned about is the victimness of the general narrative, because in the early 2000s, Ukrainians told about themselves, identify themselves, with victims and we are used to thinking about ourselves as losers of history who have tried for many times but failed and even uh, during the independence era so i think museums and museum spaces that are not always connected to walls for instance the maidan museum does not have actual walls it's just several rooms at the uh, trade union house in Kyiv. Such museums of catastrophes remember, remind us about resilience, about the readiness to start uh, all over again, and just uh, fulfilling the motto verbalized by Lina Kostenka, we are because uh, we cannot be. For instance, Taras Shevchenko, who is uh, very often dubbed as the only genius in Ukraine, maybe we could have set up a museum of slavery and we can also involve the information about the author claiming that the story of his life is also the story of his people. So I will give the microphone to Mikhailo I will try uh, to give my reflections of everything mentioned if I forget something, so maybe uh, you will just direct me uh, in the right area. So uh, what I wanted to start with is the detachment of museums from real life. There are objective reasons for that, obviously. Currently, the majority of museums, not all of them, of course, but what we are having are museums that stemmed from social socialist uh, museum school back uh, during the Soviet times museums were part of the 
national uh, Soviet narrative. And I like this phrase by Yvonne Svorstuk when we discussed the reconstruction of our museum in 2012-2013. Yvonne Svorstuk told me that the museum never taught us to love Shevchenko. It, it taught us to love the Soviet state through the figure of Taras Shevchenko. So practically it was like that for many museums and it remains a problem for museums when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990 and the overwhelming narrative disappeared museums uh, some of them let's not uh, generalize and say that the majority or minority of them but they became confused about their future and how they should convey the messages and what specific narrative they should uh, convey to the visitors so the class narrative has been replaced with the so-called national narrative to various degrees at different museums but uh, let's say that the museums were not able to adjust to the social narrative. Uh, they either were unable to do so or unwilling. But uh, let's be honest, they were not a factory for shaping of opinions. Not they were not a factory for shaping opinions. They were just the broadcasters. And they became confused on what ideas were to be broadcasted. So this confusion and lack of feedback from the visitors, lack of feedback from a certain part of uh, the society, resulted in us, I mean the museums, and I also represent uh, the museum industry, even though I wasn't working in the 90s. So the museums uh, were broadcasting very general things, general concepts, and uh, in modernity we lost the feedback with the visitors, we lost the connection with the visitors because of the general messages we were broadcasting. We were never asking questions as to what the visitors wanted to hear about. So if we speak about the Tarashevchenko Museum for quite a long time, because of this uh, museum uh, communication, because of the interpretation of the museum symbols uh, that were established, we broadcast general things that Shevchenko is the apostle of truth, the genius of the Ukrainian nation without explaining why. And we are counting on the fact that people have enough background to perceive this information. That's not true, especially if we speak about youngsters, students and pupils. People need an explanation as to why they should perceive Shevchenko like that. So this is not shown on Netflix. So it was mentioned by one of the speakers that we've done a lot in theater and cinema. So. So probably uh, for museums, that remains a problem. And for us to develop a new communication language, a new semiotic system, we lack staff, we lack museum designers, exhibitioners, and for that matter, researchers, people who can deconstruct Shevchenko and explain why he is important in different areas of uh, our life. So I'm just using the example of the Shevchenko Museum, but we can extrapolate this example onto many other museums, especially museums of local history. I, I call uh, these museums, museums of uh, local history. That's uh, that could be a part of the answer to the question why we still lack uh, contemporary national level museums uh, like Poland, Israel and other countries have. So that's probably it. Thank you. And uh, Ihor and then Anton, uh, we are giving the floor to you. As Mikhailo mentioned, he doesn't like generalizing. so. I would again come back to our more specific topic because museums do have many issues 
and maybe this is very ungrateful for us to say that our uh, museums uh, are out of date, that uh, they are uh, passive and not interesting. This is a common opinion, which is partly true, but very many people working at the museums, uh, museum teams are changing, and it's uh, obvious. Uh, there are uh, also other problems, resources, uh, the mindset, etc. Coming back to our topic, the presentation of catastrophes and memories and the commemoration of complicated history. We need to understand the very essence of memory. Uh, foreign researchers uh, speak about it very often. Coming back to the most general understanding, there are two types of memory, communicative uh, and general. So you mentioned this living memory, which is communicative memory. This is individual memory, memory of a family, a memory of witnesses of history. And researchers say it lives for 80 to 100 years, three to four generations. But we also mentioned acceleration, so the distance is between catas the distance between the catastrophe and its memorization uh, becomes shorter, and that's a trend that did not exist before. And even the famous Holocaust museums, uh, the Memorial Museum of Holocaust in the United States, was set up 50 years after the events happened. So this is not about the knowledge or resources or consensus. This is about what we are telling, to whom and why. It's about the ethics of memory. It's a global topic that is not often discussed. For instance, our museum published an international charter of memorial museums uh, developed by the International Committee IC Memo back in 2018. It's uh, already out of date. We translated it and published it. It contains very specific things about empathy, about academic approach, academic narrative, discourse, in the creation of museum exhibitions and museum programs, educational and cultural ones. And within this context, I would like to come back to the previous topic. Anton mentioned glorification, uh, citing the example of the Soviet Union. Glorification uh, for people born in the Soviet Union was not used just back uh, at that time. It is used uh, at contemporary museums in the Western countries. They are focusing on technology, on military infrastructures, such as uh, the British Museum uh, in London. So they are glorification on doing glorification on modern level and that happens when museums uh, evade highlighting critical events seeing political risks in that I was very surprised uh, when I went to the 9-11 memorial in New York because this modern memorial which was an immediate response to the catastrophe it doesn't give clear answer as to who is to blame who was punished we have the victims we have the terrorists but in this binary opposition there are no other voices there is no further context who allowed for this event to happen and who else could be behind this? So similar museums can be found not just in the United States, but also in Japan. The World War II Museum, for instance, in Japan, or the museum dedicated to the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombarding, but they don't give answers uh, regarding the reasons. Uh, they switch our attention to the general concepts of peace, wealth, fair and non-nuclear status of the planet, avoiding complicated topics. So this approach is complicated not just for Ukraine. We are saying that uh, because of the lack of consensus, we are having problems in our country, but complicated history 
is also involved in another paradox to remember to forget memorial complexes are created to mitigate the trauma uh, but frankly speaking it's not to mitigate but to forget to forget how severe the events were to forget the binary opposition between the uh, criminals and the victims and also to forget about those who were neutral witnesses of the events thank you Thank you. Sometimes it's the darkest under the lamp, so the lamp really blightens me and I do not even see my notes. So that's why I like to, um, uh, several, to hear several reflections from our speakers and then we can move to Q&A session. Uh, so to previous discussion, to previous panel, it will be more correct to say, I had a question. The question was, uh, since we were discussing topos of catastrophes in modern culture, the place of catastrophes, I had a question. So uh, there was a project of an enlightenment project that was, had a thesis. We are going to uh, teach everybody how to read and how to write and we are going to omit all problems. So this basically was destroyed by the two world, why, two world wars. Uh, it's, it seems that uh, we they they still man they managed to teach everybody to write and read and have night operas, but still we had two second words. Then there was the second hypothesis: we are going to teach everybody how to feel, and then after that, it's definitely not going to happen again. But we have different genocides. But in Srebrenica, they they were not taught how to feel the Second World War. It happened not where they were taught. Now, that's a question, that's a pretty difficult question about common responsibility space, why it was not taught, who was taught. They, um, they knew how to read and write. So then we as humanity failed in the second time in, this, in the 20th century. And I had a question whether the catastrophe First of all, we found out about the catastrophe, we started talking about this, we were talking about this for a long time. And then the catastrophe became a general place of rethinking in the 20th century. But uh, whether it really became a, a, a general place, it's uh, what you doubt, it's a good question. And the second question, maybe we made catastrophes too trivial to such an extent that they do not teach us anything right now. Because yes, we were thinking that we were talking it's very important uh, topic, uh, and then we just still left and made something bad so maybe we are just not able to do to do this we are as biological species as people it's a question it's a doubt in ourselves i think it's pretty constructive and one more thing is about our ideas not everything is so bad i still think that um, the attempts are pretty successful mm, in different regions where we formulate step-by-step -step questions and answers and we form societies not big societies that uh, can change uh, something and can give specialists uh, who go abroad and but who still turn back return to ukraine and so the, the re there appears a community that can at least verify if not make narratives of responsible and difficult remembering that's my feeling from getting known different initiatives, different initiatives, and okay, even if such communities appear. It takes time. I don't know whether it's long time or short time. It's I suffer. I look at different uh, countries, but, <laughs> but maybe it's fast if we take into account. Um, I was talking about Yad Vashem, about Israeli um, experience, the ex nation forming of Israel excluding uh, institution. It means that their memory is alive, their trauma is alive. They push back from the trauma and they created their institutions, their society. Our history was, our great thinkers were talking about this uh, sleeping phenomenon that we were put to sleep. So maybe this was the reason. Maybe it's an excuse that I would just like to find. But the process is ongoing, and 
what I'm going to say now may be not very relevant to our topic, but still, we have now war for independence. Russian-Ukrainian war is war for independence, where with one hand we are trying to get back uh, from uh, our enemies, and with the one hand we are trying to build institutions of difficult memories and create state, and we try to form this consensus, and it's at the same time. That's our situation. I hope that uh, we are going to be lucky here. The question, why do we need to uh, research this and why do we need to do this? That's a also a very important question, very important issue. And each of us um, talk about this from time to time. I ask this when I talk with students. So they ask me this question. I say, well, OK, there are lots of things already um, and, uh, made, but still after Holocaust, we have uh, other genocides about uh, which we know or don't know that much, for example, genocide in Indonesia. But what would happen if we did not um, such if we did not have such research, if we did not have museums, if we did not write? I understand that it's a very small example, but still, if we change at least one person, if we influence at least one person, that's already a lot. That's step by step. And I have to reflect on what was mentioned, uh, what has been mentioned by Anton, that yes, trauma can cause the identity of the person and society. Trauma, the societies are built around traumas. We have examples of our uh, in internally displaced people of our IDPs. And my uh, student was recently surprised that, that they still go there to that area, those to the ancestors that have never been there, they go to, that, to those areas and they perceive it as their own. It's another trauma we have to work with, that we uh, try to work with. I wanted to discuss one more aspect of trust to museums of those catastrophes. Trust of Ukrainian institutions is pretty low. All our problems take start here. But trust to museums that work with the topic of trauma, catastrophe, what type of trauma is this? Do we know what it is? I can uh, say on the example of our museum, on the one hand, uh, that we, that we as a museum do this, it's very important for people. It's not some kind of private initiative or not somebody came from abroad and uh, uh, was going to record something for us or do something for us. No, we here are dealing with our issues, with our traumas, with our problems, and we try to do something. But on the other hand, the, the pretty huge mistrust, it also goes from the fear but on the other hand, you're a national uh, state museum. Uh, where have you been before? What did you do before? I can say that 10 years ago, I was still in the university or um, some younger colleagues can say that they were in the school. Uh, but this question still exists because institutions should have continuity. So we need to fight for this trust and to work with community. It seems that that ethics of memory and uh, discussing the first catastrophe, first memories should be, there should be huge work with uh, audience and with people who have lived through that trauma and this building of this community should be around those people. That's what we are trying to do to a certain extent when those people are co-creators of museum. With some of them we have pretty good relations when they come back, when they want to conduct our events, uh, their events in our space when their grandchildren come to look at the uh, grandmother to see at their witnesses, uh, testimonies. And we understand that uh, traumas can, uh, can, uh, can go from generation to generation. Uh, this grandson cannot come to the museum and read about his grandmother in official uh, space when we do not have orientation schemes. Here we are going to just have to read up. And do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, Hari, PE teacher. Uh, first of all, you are not going to solve any of your problems or, or our. Not you're 
If you do not understand, I have already discussed to you, um, Don, we have to give historic knowledge, historical knowledge to uh, pupils in schools. In school, you do not have culture uh, uh, subjects of uh, the next world, European culture, and in Europe, they are definitely dealing with it on a very deep level. So until we understand that our professors, our culturologists have to go to the school, there should be some... Uh, extracurricular activities, uh, history teachers should be very well educated uh, for pupils just to be happy that they have history lessons. We have better history teachers that, uh, and uh, pupils love history because of them. So until this problem is solved, our uh, culture is going to be dead. And why, why, why are we not talking about Ministry of Culture? What they are dealing with? Why do we not have anybody from this ministry at this point? Why? why they did not thank you for your great nice meeting i just wanted to say immediately that what I, everything that you say is of course true and it makes sense but you should remember that museums are not educational institutions actually if we talk about museums, I just wanted to say that, in my opinion, in modern society, museums cannot give answers to all questions. If we talk about society consensus, about some consensus of memories, museum cannot give answers for each person, final answer. And modern museum, in my opinion, is rather first chain in uh, understanding and getting to know something than the last one. So you shouldn't think that for getting out of the museum, person knows all the answers to all the questions. That's also a disputable, disputable uh, question. But in the modern world, I think that museum should encourage to thinking and to um, finding out the information. And everything else, the pers a person should do on his or her own, with our help, of course. Probably it's connected with this wider uh, definition of, um, of culture that we have right now. People go to the museum not just to look at something or to hear something. They go there for just some things to happen to them. And uh, in one of the essays in the beginning of the 90s, there was the question, are you going to know what happened with you if people are um, without those sense-creating institutions, if they do not have this possibility to face with some already voiced uh, experiences, they cannot talk about their own experience, about their own role in history. We and we need to think that in democratic societies, every person at particular moment should play a role in history. So it's not so terrible to measure yourself so and the phrase of uh, of uh, the decree of mayor is definitely is not so bad our today is definitely going to be yesterday and uh, museums help to think about that now getting back to catastrophe notions and catastrophism i at the beginning wanted to think about catastrophe as of something that is like shattering well uh, shattering foundations but then i realized that shattering of the basis is not so bad architectures can sometimes um, even suggest such uh, option to take off any kind of building from fun uh, from uh, its fundamental uh, basis and then move it a little bit so if we talked about traditional museum uh, then we talk we live in pretty um, in such a s um, an era that all those main points can still be uh, deleted or even changed. I'm going to discuss with you here a little bit. Methodologically and theoretically, it uh, sounds very beautifully. Uh, shattering of foundations is not always bad thing, but as soon as we go to specific level, Holodomor, Holocaust, the Second World War, deportation of Crimea Tatars, uh, genocide, you will not be able to tell that it's not so bad. Nobody is going is going to to will be able to tell this. So accordingly, we need to do something with such things. We need to make some conclusions. 
because you have a disruption here, yes, those the biggest catastrophes that you have listed, they uh, talk about apocalypses, about how uh, how one way of life, one connection with landscape, one culture disrupted. It could have had one beginning, but its uh, story was disrupted, was interrupted. I meant that the very world catastrophe, if you translate it from Greek, means shattering of foundations. And Kata prefixes is not so terrible. In the catalog, for example, world, we have the same prefix, and it's, uh, mea it means descending from the top to the bottom. And uh, maybe it's in the way to the view and re log certain things, but on the, o the other thing is that people start fear of something when the user face some catastrophe, or, um, the and then it can be too late to look uh, through those uh, foundations. But sometimes it can lead you to question whether you live properly. Uh, so in the end of that war that we are conducting, are we going to be more of people or less of people? So it's the same as the word category, or in, in any case, I would like to answer to Hrihori, our constant uh, listener, and we discussed behind curtains, uh, you started, you have to give. There is, uh, there are certain people they think th who think that we need to gather all teachers in one place and fire them and they are going to go to their schools and teach everybody from good things. No, it's not, it doesn't work like this. You can have 100, uh, 1000 conferences in Kiev, as you suggested, tell everybody uh, how to like, uh, how to love um, um, uh, countries, but it's always some subject chemistry, it's always the possibility to provoke. So I was ready, I don't even talk about some demanding. So I, for example, like observing uh, modern uh, teachers, young teachers. There are really some very inspirational teachers who leave universities because of weird teaching, because of very small salaries. And some people, they choose a different way. They are really great uh, teachers and they work for 7,500 hryvnias salaries every day, day by day. This is the paradox reality. M I am not even going to uh, say and to demand from all, all people to go this way. And that's why you need to understand it's very difficult configuration. Here we have already economy and education and culture. <laughs> um, we do not have so much time left, but before finishing, I would like to give the floor to Kristina and Ivan because they did not have, they haven't had the opportunity to voice their uh, thoughts. Uh, it's uh, I, it seems that we still haven't mentioned such important thing that memorialization and visitation of catastrophe is extremely important element of the geostrategic of uh, of legislation and preparation. Of interim justice and uh, maybe even uh, memorization of such events can be good proof of si of those crimes made by the state. And on the other hand, memorialization is also some kind of reparation when you um, kind of give back to those uh, victims uh, that uh, you remember them and uh, they are remembered by people. So this aspect is extremely important, but. But uh, I would like to support Hrihori here a little bit, that we all remember the principles of democracy, uh, that principles of missing, that still in 1880-something uh, John Cotton, the founder of uh, American Legislation Museum, he, has he mentioned that museums serve states and they should always, uh, they're important for everybody. And it, if our society changes from informational one to the one that is learning role of museum in this now in this informal world, in creating the uh, creating the fear for deepening one's knowledge, it's very it has huge prospects. And uh, I understand because it is this uh, this uh, this appeal from society for museums to change for them to be platforms to get for getting new knowledge. 
or at least deepening of those knowledge that are forbidden in previous epochs. Thank you, the very fact that we are talking about museums, uh, museums here, it, it changes topic, but at the same time it makes it sharper. So there is still space for somebody who can still go there and uh, to learn something and interact. Yes, museums shouldn't be just places where you can go and familiarize yourself with the exhibits. It's the it sort of should be a platform to not only to hear answers but also to ask questions. And we do realize that for the last thousand years, it's a fact that museum is not a place where we uh, get uh, answers, but where we uh, start we learn how to ask questions. And only after we do this, we can start giving c uh, answers to those correct questions. And we cover the topic of education, even though I have mentioned about the um, importance of mediator. Our museum uh, tries to work with teachers through working with them, and they those teachers form teams of pupils who we, we have workshops for them, and then they have uh, testimonies. Uh, it's a great scheme, but we need really huge enthusiasm of teachers in this case. Uh, despite the fact that sometimes if you work with, or if you work on some projects, we even can uh, uh, somehow give rewards for this job. But at the same time, it's constant communication with children. You need to constantly have this desire to do something new. And other standard plan on how museums work, there are uh, this excursion, school trips, uh, and we have to uh, conduct hold excursions for them. So imagine the sev people from the seventh grade come to listen about the Second World War and Holocaust. What do they know? So it's creation of this speech, of this language on how to talk with children about those topics. It's not so easy. It's difficult uh, for even for adults to work on this empathy and to talk about this topic. But here we have teachers. Uh, they who come and say, tell to, to children, show your museum. So it's a constant dialogue that should happen with us, and we need to think about how to find this, the, the right words to talk about our audience if they come to us about those topics. And of course, what Ihor has mentioned about memory and uh, justice. If uh, Nuremberg, has ha Nuremberg took place, but but there was not a trial of criminals. Yes, we didn't have Stalinism. So from this, well, it's also difficult to work with this topic. Museums should even take this role of, uh, you, so if you talk about something, you, you tell us about this catastrophe that took place before us, before our community. You talk about this to society, to the world. And that's one more thing, and I would also like to reflect, uh, to react on this metaphor about um, this shattering. If you go away from shattering, uh, meaning with, together with catastrophe, we need to say that those shatterings are needed for us because we always work with difficult topic and we always can fail, fall into abyss. And it's a very difficult ground we are working on. And it's in this meaning, this metaphor is very relevant for me. So today we were talking about that in Ukraine we live in seismic uh, zone of uh, memory. Uh, diff diff different uh, changes are still uh, taking place with it, are still happening. The society is not single, it, belong, it consists of different communities. And it's okay, that's how it is in every country that it's a house for lots of people from different political um, likes and so on and so forth. It's a different side of, of democracy. But on the other hand, we live uh, under the long shadow of past. So there were times when not just people were thinking about their fate and not the heads of the sites were thinking with those uh, decisions were outsourced from some distant countries that did not care about fates of the whole population sometimes. And we, museums are actually fighting with this, and Institute of National Memory as it is. On the one hand, we can say that natural people, human nature is terrible, we cannot do anything with this, ancient Greeks knew about that, and in Shumer and in Assyria they knew about that, but 
that uh, population is not just sum of all the negatives but also all positive sides and on this on this point i would like to finish with the sentence that ethics is also changing it's also with the open finale uh, quant ethics can't can't ethics cannot be uh, used now and we can actually say that it was pretty individualistic too individualistic when whereas hans jonas at uh, um, in the 1980s mentioned that categorical imperative should be continued in future so what does it it means that in early enlightenment people have more imperial power who had more imperial power they did not make such decision that could uh, terminate life of people on earth at all or for example terminate bio life on earth but for, on the other hand we now have people who have some threatening power and who have who can make such decisions so ethics of memory is also the ethics of responsibility for future almost always we have to teach people how to work on context so consensus uh, decisions not only, <laughs> only thinking about their egoistic interest but even if you talk about some specific community uh, Levites, Ukrainians, Eastern Europeans now we are in the planet, planetary scale as well and it's extremely crucial people are looking at us we are looking at the, the world is looking at us we are looking at the world and those 30 years of borders and uh, this fluctuation of uh, ideas, senses, people, we see that our neighbors are also in the same traps. Uh, Germany couldn't, uh, couldn't um, uh, Germany, Poland, uh, Spain uh, could not deal with this to the fullest. And we, the right, uh, if to be fair, the right the parties shouldn't be in Bundestag right now, but they are there. So we need to see that the very processes that take place in museums are some kind of uh, are basically mirrors of some bigger processes that take place in society. They tell us about us and good museums, they tell us about us in the present and not about us who were in the past. There is this effect of old pictures, Marianne Hirsch joked about this. When we look at old pictures, we always consider themselves wiser than those we are, who we are looking at because we know what everything happened, what was everything ended with for them. We don't know how it's going to be for us, but thankfully we can uh, make decisions about this. And we have the component of education, but not only teachers or museum employees teach guests or students or pupils who come to them. We also uh, learn from them about them. So this question still stays with us. We need to be open to changes, ready for changes. And we need to understand that sometimes those changes are painful. They shatter the foundations of our basis of the world, but only they can give us chance to adapt and to live in the future. So I think it is extremely difficult, but very needed uh, topic, and it cannot be uh, covered completely for one hour and a half. I express gratitude for all interlocutors. I know that you are going to be interviewed on this topic I know that you are going to talk behind curtains about that and it's still you have two days of uh, Congress the Congress of culture is still going on it was the, we were talking about post catastrophic ethic of memory in museum space in Ukraine
Германська тридцятня. Це подія не була можлива без підтримки Львівської міської ради, без підтримки The second half uh, of the first day uh, will be happening without a coffee break. Uh, and towards the end, we will have a lecture by uh, Andrian Ivahi, which you can find in your program. I would now like to introduce you to the moderator of our discussion, a TV journalist and presenter of uh, Svoboda Slova, Freedom of Speech TV program, Vadim Karpiak. So uh, we have two news, uh, one good and one bad. The good news is that uh, I'm pleased to introduce our today's panelists. Our panel will not be gender balanced. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let's start with uh, Irina Podolak. I traditionally introduce her as uh, the MP of the eighth convocation of uh, Verkhovna Rada because you know that uh, this woman uh, participated in the development of many draft laws pertaining to culture. Next to Irina Podolyak, we have Tetyana Shulha, who is sectoral manager of the representative office of EU in Ukraine, but you will hear that Tetyana is a wonderful public speaker. And next to Tetyana, we have uh, Olesa Ostrovska Luta, uh, the general director of uh, Mestetsky Arsenal. And next to Olesa, we were supposed to have our Minister of Culture, who was present during the official inauguration ceremony. We decided uh, that this holy place cannot be vacant. Ms. Our Minister called, not him, but his press secretary called and told us that there was an emergency meeting where he had to participate, hence his absence during this panel discussion. Uh, the Security and Defense Council is having a meeting that uh, we were told about, but as, uh, as far as I know, the meeting is planned for tomorrow, not today, but and uh, unfortunately, the minister will not be here with us uh, and the conversation will be quite one-sided without him being present. Another good news is that we will break our format a little bit because I was uh, listening attentively to Vahtan Kebuladze who told me that he felt like Mussolini standing on the balcony with a projector beaming into your eyes and it's quite a symbolism that the speakers are separated from the audience, the state is separated from the public, the managers are separated from the society. So we have decided to go down and have this conversation about the system of the ecosystem of culture downstairs. We even have the lights here, so 
take a seat wherever you feel comfortable. Everybody decided to go that way. So I will stand, I will rather sit beside you and I have another mic. So you can take it. So formally I will read the title of our today's panel according to our program, uh, Culture Ecosystem Crisis or the Growth Disease. As a person uh, who is working on a political show, I will use a political method. I would ask you to vote. The things currently happening with the Ukrainian uh, ecoculture, who thinks it's a crisis? Raise your hands. Or a, a growth disease, so that's the second option. So, who is for crisis? Thank you. And who believes it's a, a growing up disease? So, these are not mutually exclusive factors, but if you have this opposition, so these are the two options. I will now have a, a bleed survey for our panelists. Tatiana, what do you think? Is it a crisis or disease? I believe that this is a growing up disease because we are speaking about more long-term things, um, something that has to do with a decade at least. Uh, Irena, I think it's a crisis. And we can tell that it's a crisis only when one crisis is over and the next one starts. The short period in between it gives us a realization of whether the previous period was a crisis. I think that we are currently in the moment, which helps us realize that it's a crisis. But as I'm telling you always, crisis, crises are different, so the consequences may be different. I support the opinion already voiced that these are both options. So probably this is a crisis that has to do with promotion and one of the reasons is that uh, the world in which we are living and which we are formulating with our life does not coincide with the institutional uh, borders and legislative uh, limits in which we are functioning. So we have already reached that limit. So growing up disease, crisis and two options. I wonder what our minister would tell us, but unfortunately he is not here with us at the moment. So I would come back to the statement made by Irina. If it's a crisis, so this is a drama trick to discuss the crisis first. Why is it a crisis? Since 2014, we've had many new institutions established. The old institutions have been revamped. People come for congresses of culture and many things that never happened in the past are currently happening. Uh, yes, we've had some issues with elections uh, for the Dovzhenko Center, Mestaitsky Arsenal, Ukrainian Culture Fund, but this doesn't negate all the positive things that happened in the past and that are still happening. So why is this a crisis? In my opinion, it is a crisis primarily because all the players, I would use this metaphor, everybody is swimming in this pond, in this lake, uh, the ecosystem of a lake. We are all swimming in it. So we are the participants, the cohabitants of this lake. So together with us, we have some fish, we have some insects, uh, we have snakes and other species, the biological diversity. And if we haven't learned to adapt to each other, to hear each other, to communicate and cooperate with each other, uh, that was the reason for the crisis emerging because the availability of institutions that demand for the institutions is not the end goal. Institutions that have been created in Ukraine, the aim of their setup was to give opportunity for the growth of the ecosystem. 
which in fact we didn't have because there was no cooperation, no relationship between independent players and the state, no trust between the governmental agencies, no trust between the people who consume culture and the institutions or persons who suggest uh, this culture, who offer it to those who consume it. So the situation is as it is because there's lack of trust, lack of collaboration. There is no joint desire to achieve some great end goal on the part of all stakeholders. It appears that everybody has a different objective. Some people want to make money, others want to keep their positions. Uh, another group of people want to implement their project and they live in between those projects, forgetting to live. For some people, the idea is to live based on these long-term uh, projects. And as Vakhtan mentioned in the morning, uh, culture sh shouldn't develop in a revolutionary way. It should be slow, but in, in order to achieve this development, we need to collaborate. We need to have the necessary expertise and we lack these things. We are solidarizing only when something happens. Uh, I will now finish, I will stop here, I think it's important that I voice this idea. When something happened to a new institution such as the Ukrainian Culture Fund, put yourself in place of the person who had, under the existing circumstances, that you are all aware of who had to create a machine, a huge machine from scratch. The machine had no idea about values. The entire institution had to understand the values. So put yourself in place of that manager of the institution. Imagine everything from hiring staff the thing uh, mentioned during the previous panel and also think about everything that goes into launching this machine, launching this institution as a result of the three years of work and uh, three years is a meager amount. Unions of writers or unions of journalists have existed since 1935 and the only thing that we know about them is that they exist and we know nothing about the things that they achieve. They are funded from the state budget, from their activities that we know nothing about. And this institution in three years started the process of creating the ecosystem of setting the rules, setting uniform rules for all. They fought their inner self suggesting a multi-level protection against corruption, against uh, subjectivity. Of course, uh, we, we are not God and we cannot feed uh, everyone with fish that we have. There will be some people uh, not satisfied with the results of work. But the creation of such an institution, which was positioned as the main state investor in just culture, I think uh, it's hard to achieve and this demonstrates the crisis of not being ready, of a lack of saturation with people who could apply to state foundations, who could report to state foundations, who could use the state budget funds to realize this end goal. So we have created such an institution. Over three meager years, this institution gave us hope that we can try and live together, that we can try and create this ecosystem. And what we are currently seeing, the institution still exists. Nothing has changed, formally speaking. 
it's been established by a specific law and it operates according to a specific law, but the institution has lost its legitimacy. And I can be frank about it. It's my opinion the institution lost its legitimacy because of the management. And as far as I understand, tomorrow the executive director of the institution will be present during this Congress. Unfortunately, you will not be having the supervisory board members present or the head of the foundation so that we have an open, frank conversation with them. But the institution has lost its legitimacy. Uh, I'm coming to an end with my speech, but what it showed us is quite important. This metamorphosis, which took place, asks the question of morality, ethics, and reputation. And these are all the questions asked not to the management, not to the current management or supervisory board of the Ukrainian Culture Fund, but these are the questions that all of us have to answer. To what degree we are ready to tolerate this, to tolerate the people who have the power, any kind of power, be it a minister who unfortunately is not here with us and he had to be here for this discussion, be it a person who doesn't file their tax return, or who just has uh, their cat as the owner of their property and uh, here I also mean heads of our ministries. I had a question for Alexander, our minister of culture. How can we speak about reputation, culture, morality or any type of growth and our relationship inside this lake if our main values have been undermined? So that's why my answer is it is a crisis. Understand? I understand this answer. My response to your statement is that crisis is something that has happened after a period of stability. Uh, speaking uh, in simple terms, when everything uh, was uh, very good and then something bad happened. It seems to me that nothing, uh, that in our ecosystem the situation has never been very positive. So I have a question for Tatiana. Do you consider that this is a growing up disease that uh, has to do with uh, growing up processes? This is a lake where fish was uh, just thrown in and the fish need to learn to live with uh, each other. Here we ha can have very many different explanations, very many factors, one of them being financial because the distribution of funds using the old methods, uh, relying on uh, acquaintances, on nepotism, and it's less uh, effective than the uh, competitive system established by the Ukrainian Culture Fund. And another factor could be just a comparison with a specific system. If a system has been destroyed and replaced with a new one, which is just uh, starting off and is showing good results, so Just to process this uh, growth and development of a new, more expensive system, it's an impossible task because it calls for resistance, apparent resistance. And this resistance will not allow for us to come back to the previous system because we have changes in the system, we have new opinion leaders, and we have new methods of communication uh, in the sphere. Before uh, my introduction, I'd like to say that I take care of the culture sector as an observant, because the representative office is not involved in solving any issues, but each year since 2018, I read some reports, I go to the ministry's website, and I pay close attention to how things are going on. 
And the changes that we are witnessing just uh, look back to the situation 10 years ago, not just five years ago. We cannot compare the two situations. We are currently in the middle of a new stage where we need to to set some footing. This is not a regress. This is just an increase of the temperature of the person having a disease. But again, if we compare ourselves to the time 10 years ago, the progress has been so immense that uh, I think the change is irreversible. Coming back to that state is irreversible. Thank you. Now coming to Olese. You know, told us that when there was a threat to institution, uh, and you specifically meant the Ukrainian culture call, uh, fund, but uh, I would just uh, apply this to other institutions as well, not just the Ukrainian culture fund. And Irena said that uh, the community and activists uh, got mobilized and uh, got together. In one of your interviews uh, in June to the Divay Barakh publication, you said that the community on thought that uh, with the establishment of the Ukrainian Culture Fund, uh, people relaxed a little bit. So do we have this mobilization capacities of the community? Coming back to what Tatiana said, that we have already achieved some progress and uh, we need to, uh, to start footing here. So thank you for the question in this interview i was speaking about the state of affairs before uh, the crisis started when there was uh, the change of supervisory board at the ukrainian culture fund announced i think that back then uh, the culture community did not pay significant attention to that having gotten used over the three-year period that the ukrainian culture fund was working and fulfilling its promises so we can hear this world promise in american political science so over those couple of years uh, the ukrainian culture fund was uh, operating effectively so uh, many members of the community perceived it as the new norm but uh, further events showed us that uh, we've just reached the norm, but the norm uh, was not uh, our reality. We did not fix this norm. Yes, we did have a progress, but it wasn't a norm for us as yet. I would like to come back to structural reasons. Metaphorically speaking, I think we remind ourselves of Alice in Wonderland, uh, that ate something and started growing up and the room in which she is uh, has gotten too small for her. So this is um, my opinion of looking at the operation of the institution. If we imagine this institution as one that has to be open to culture activists and audience listening to their needs and responding to those needs, then I think that such activities are hindered by our very, by our existing legislative framework. All the legislative and regulatory requirements which uh, we have for us and institutions have been designed for a different society than the society we are striving to become. So such an institution and its staff find themselves in a situation uh, when imagine this uh, dimensional shape. You are an institution somewhere in between. Above you, you have this legislative framework represented by government agencies, uh, auditing authorities and similar institutions. And in parallel to you, you have the community with which you interact and you have different demands coming from above you. That provisional framework, legislative framework, asks you to be submissive and it controls you very seriously. This is a vertically integrated system 
which neglects the community. Responding to the request of the community is complicated and so we can pay with human faiths for mistakes in this sphere. So we have this situation when inside the institutions we have stagnation processes. Institution managers quickly realize that any step they take is potentially dangerous uh, except for paying minimum wages and paying their utility bills, paying for electricity but not for gas owing to the increased prices. So what you have to do is to do the bare minimum. Doing nothing is one of the only safe strategies. When you try to act and change something, you have to do something that is not typical. And that means that you cannot integrate with the structure above you. So you have uh, more people in the state sector who are stagnators. They are not bad people. Mm. They have well, they get, have good intentions, but they are just the people who have realized uh, they are risking many things if they start actually doing something. The other group are idealists who are trying to respond to the requests of the real world. They try to challenge the rigid limits they have been put into and they sometimes pay with their own fate for such decisions. And I often describe this as new dissidents because dissidents are people that are trying to expand the holes in the system that is uh, a threat to the living world. And within this system, I have we have this uh, small share here. I'm just describing the state sector. We have a group of people who are abusing. So they are only performing the tasks uh, that meet their personal interests, ensuring that they are safe and protected. So basically, this is the situation in which we, are, we have found ourselves now. So, in 2014, we had this strategic document developed, which had a list of tasks. And the first task was to do a review and analysis of the legislative framework. I mean, uh, some uh, provisional we, not me and you. So, we decided to postpone that task and take a different way. So. We decided not to change the legislative framework and and then just change the institutions. We decided to create different institutions first and they, as the icebreakers, were to break the existing framework. And it was a price, a high price to pay because we had to pay with people. And our icebreakers have hit a wall like Alice in Wonderland who has grown up. So we are now coming back to task number one and we need to analyze the legislative framework. And this is a very abstract task because we don't know where to start. So that is practically where we are at the moment. So basically, um, dealing with Ukrainian culture is still some kind of cross, well, um, well not really cross, but everybody takes on himself or herself and they carry it as long as they can. But one of them was Irena, who tried to change this process legislatively, and they did change it. But now Irena is also having stones thrown at her because uh, something has changed, uh, uh, not how it should have been changed, and uh, yes, and it shouldn't have been changed at the first place. Yes, of course, they will definitely tell you how it should have been done. But why we couldn't? use this window of opportunities to build that ecosystem, as Eliza has mentioned, when legislation changes first and then we build normal institutions, not vice versa. What did, pre what prevented us? Well, really everything prevented us. At that time, when that change of legislation took place, started from the law of 1915, 
2015. That was my not full year in Parliament. And finishing with that not was my last that was not my last law, but still the one that I was um, leading is the law on Ukrainian language. And among that, the law on Ukrainian cultural fund uh, changes on um, in on cinematography, which took place during the eighth canons. In this uh, that time, they have just they were just um, uh, improved. So there was no infrastructure. The whole infrastructure, culture, and you know about that. At least those who work in non-state sector the existence of basic network of uh, culture uh, institutions. It's very uh, Soviet um, rudiment and lots of progressive politicians, among which we have, for example, uh, first convocation when Olesa worked in the ministry, when Johanna uh, they tried, they tried to change the design of this whole field in which the culture is working in Ukraine, and it's pretty difficult. But it is pretty difficult to do when you are in uh, government and power. It's much easier to introduce changes and initiate changes, legislative changes, if you are not in power in the government. I believe that's I mentioned 2015, now we have 2021st, so it's like, what, six years has passed since those, those first changes, like really, ten, really significant changes. During those six years, actors, there were much more actors in the sphere, they became uh, much more capable, and we have become much more experienced intellectual, we started understanding processes that take place and we ask those questions that I have mentioned when I was talking for the first time, whether it is uh, morally, what is the reputation of each of us and of those who we are communicating with. I do believe that this concept is going to come back to us. I don't think that politicians are going to uh, to shoot each other for a lie. Uh, we do not need this blood, but I do believe that they are going to uh, get rid of their positions on the pressure of uh, population and society. And I do believe that we together can, if we, if we take small responsibility, we can articulate to the government which because it is not a power above us, you understand, we are all three people. It's uh, managers, basically, that have political functions, important political functions, then have the function of talking, explaining, this is the manager, that this, is, um, this is my political program, now I'm here, now we are going to implement this uh, program. Uh, which is part of the actions of the government. In, in the reality, it looks that great producer, amazing producer of the one of the most successful TV channels, genius professional in his sphere, and not only he, not only he, you understand that there are not with us. We are discussing all of this, we are thinking how to do this better, how to make this ecosystem acceptable for everybody, so that everybody can learn how to coexist. But again, we are talking without one participant of ecosystem, without one who actually widens or narrows banks of this river in which we are all swimming. This is not natural, this is not right. I have never liked those ritual things when mayor or minister or some authority that is uh, like this for a certain period of time comes and says that uh, I, uh, I welcome all of you, great, good luck, uh, good, then, and then goodbye, and that's all. And what everything what is going on after this, everything what is discussed, I do not have time. What you do not have time for? It's not respect, 
you can listen to several to several panels you can choose what you need you do have your schedule yes but it's not only about the current minister or only this minister you know that all ministers act like this that's why i believe that we have the possibility to create appeal we have the possibility to have interventions or iterations as they call it now and we have the uh, the right to influence the power the government but first of all we need to gather and articulate clearly the problems that we have and i would like to express my gratitude to olesa uh, because she mentioned culture 2025 i uh, advise you uh, to search on the internet and find that naive beautiful but very good document great work has been done and this document has not been read by politicians thoroughly because lots of work that i encourage you to and i motivate you for has already been covered and that uh, we have created ukrainian cultural fund because it was indicated that we need to create an institution that will make equal uh, level field for uh, our money and we they did it but to finish my speech i would like to appeal to you tanya you have mentioned that we are developing we are not in that cultural field and i know that Eliza is also optimism she shares optimistic view i have to be the trickster as Chizhanova uh, called me in uh, during the break. I have to do this. It's very fast, but I have to do this. I'm going to read very fast this program document. It's extremely interesting. Proud and, uh, and shame, gratefulness and anger. That's the title. Such, pr such emotions occupied me when I uh, visited a concert of uh, choreography of uh, national choreography maybe you haven't read I, I i will read it for you proud for ukraine i'm proud for ukrainian culture for those children uh, and uh, adults who gave their love to ukrainian dance who uh, inspirationally demonstrated the beautiful the beauty of national choreography on the stage of uh, opera house of ukraine we are really grateful to Miroslav Vantuk, to the, all the jury members, to the organizers, and national choreographical members, choreographers, dancers, some amateurs, 1,300 um, teams from the whole Ukraine took part in this uh, artistic uh, project. I bow to all of them, preserving creative code of the nation, please remember that and giving this from generation to the generation. But I felt anger to those pseudo-cultural uh, activists and authority representatives, someone, which I, someone who I unfortunately have my colleagues, who will give uh, money to some empty projects and uh, you are, okay. The only luggage that is knowledge of phone numbers of influential heads of the government is probably those who had appealed to the Ministry of Culture for money. And only Piero Manzoni uh, pictures can um, be bigger than their achievements. It's a shame when the project of such competition is rejected and left and left without um, funding even though one day uh, ac campaigns where members participants can be counted on the fingers of one hand again multi-million grants but yeah they're also going to be in prison until we have national budget stated and 
we still have the chance to change this Pol this politics of Ukrainian cultural fund, giving priority to saving uh, real essences of Ukrainian this, this traditions. This text was written by the first deputy head of the current Ministry of Culture head, Rostislav Karandiev who, when we went to the ministry for a very short period of time, he left the ministry. And then when we left the ministry, he returned to the to much uh, more serious position to the first deputy head of culture. Uh, it's about development. You say that we are not where we were 10 years ago, and to us, a politician of the highest... But he's crying. Karandiev is crying. He is happy. We are going to cry very fast, I think. Uh, but to, uh, to be fair, 10 years ago, Ministry of Culture played violin in a very difficult and interesting way. And now the first uh, deputy had is worrying about National Code of Nations. That's a progress. Yes, I agree. <laughs> After such optimistic note, we definitely have to play on Bandura, I believe. But I... I'm going to get back to the previous question about legislation. So, when we, uh, just as an observer, for 2015, it was maximum, uh, it was as, as, um, as great uh, law as possible, taking into account capabilities of the authors. Because at that moment, that uh, uh, law could have been written by Yulia Fedev, knowing and uh, living through certain, so several cycles in the Ukrainian Cultural Fund. Uh, and I think that uh, we are going, if you are going to be now also more critical than you were three years ago. So this capability, I, I now remember a strategic session organized by Yula on the, at the beginning. And I was uh, surprised at that time. I tried to stand up and then I realized that it was not my story. But if to talk about, talk about project, projective management that leads through many competitions, I was uh, absolutely um, uh, surprised by the naivety of uh, participants. When Hudimov, who is absolutely, uh, uh, who has absolute experience, but he did not understand that this is not going to uh, happen in three days. He has never had a choosing of competitions uh, for such great amount of money. He did not understand that it's going to be uh, certain stages. So at the same time, it's processes. I hope that now those all, all that work that have been done by experts that live through those stories and understand what we are talking about, when they live through those stories, they we will really be able now, in a year, in two years, incorporate this into the law. And uh, they're going to use it in the practices of Ukrainian Cultural Foundation. I believe that it is going to be like this. It is great when we can cite the first deputy head of the minister, everybody smiling, but for at what is happening right now in our talk, I see one very dangerous element and symptom. We have here people who care, who really care about that culture. Uh, and I hear once again about this, uh, I hear this, there are we and there are some kind of they, that mean a st the state and a state apparatus, and we do not have the symbiosis here. And we treat this uh, state apparatus ministry as something um, already uh, holistic, to, uh, so, uh, holistic to us, as we treated uh, this as an enemy, and that's once again the threat of some disruption and of clash. And it's do we have some kind of stay there? Yes, it's definitely danger because this is how we get back to the situation of this division. The, the, there are we and there are they on the sector which. Uh, gives uh, support and sector which is which is deprived of support it seems to me that we step back but there is one thing i absolutely share the opinion that yes we lack trust 
but there is a lack of trust to institutions because of objective reasons, which I tried to describe earlier. Those formal uh, legal conditions in which we exist, they are counterproductive to our life. But they should have uh, cha they should be changed through political process but this political process emancipation from soviet political project we still haven't had it we it, it uh, just started happening after 2013 consciously so everything that was before that functioned in like a different political dream and this political dream was about implementation of marxism story of transition to some uh, non-class society, to communism and so on and so forth. So when this um, dream uh, collapsed at the level of the state, it did not disappear on the level of that state framework, that legislative framework we are in, all you know, people, institution and so on. But we have not uh, understood this for a very long time. In cultural society, based on my observations as a member of this uh, society for the last 30 years, cultural society leave, even if it's left radical part, in liberal dream. The Ukrainian Cultural Foundation is the is basically the consequence of this dream and our legislation continues to exist in totalitarian dream and this conflict is constant it paralyzes our uh, moving forward it puts us behind all the time throws us behind all the time sorry that i'm talking about some structural abstracts uh, but it's uh, we, we, we even with the laughter we cannot fight such things it can be fought only through political process what does it mean sorry but it takes it's it takes long time and it's probably unpleasant it's political real political parties which we as society always try to change like party holos was one of such attempts and they fail they fail uh, every time so in this problem how can we deal here and then because of this political process because of the emergence of those actors of legislators in the parliament this framework should be changed it should be in parallel with our activity with our institutions it all should take place at the same time but it's a huge process we do not have separate uh, hostile individualities here which we are going to get rid of and everything is going to be great no the thing is not in separate people it's the thing is in structural conditions of course i don't want to be that naive uh, there are of course uh, people with hostile intentions but our main problem is not in this the main problem is is that we, you know, uh, as they always as usually say in the uh, in media, we do not know what kind of society we built. I'm very, very sorry, but it is a banal truth, because we as, as, as citizens did not have have not created a party. Uh, we have a liberal dream which has not been implemented on political level, and uh, this is the reason of our problems. I just say this for us to understand that it's all a little bit further that our hands can reach. Hallelujah. So, um, usually they say to journalists that we uh, say something wrong. Now it's parties. Okay, eventually we uh, get to politicians. But I want to kind of continue this talk. It's kind of shifting of responsibility. It's not we who are to blame, but parties. We do not have parties who can change the situation. Uh, no, the the one who is the, uh, uh, it, it cannot say that somebody is to blame here. It's the circumstances in which we all function and which we need to overcome. Okay, then I will reformulate this, and I will move to that uh, thesis: institutions or personalities, because party that's an institution. It's a boring job, everyday job, uh, building uh, centers of the parties and so on. It's pretty bureaucratic uh, job and we see that in the world, even in the old world, parties of traditional type, they die off. And even France, which 
used to have part, part, uh, party system. We have there is a Macron and there is a new there is Macron and there is a new party. Parties are built for leaders and leaders form parties. And Holos was also formed not as an ideological project, but as a project of Svetoslav Vakarchuk. So, waiting for this legislation system to be changed by some bureaucracy, bureaucracy machine. I don't know whether it's right that we rely on uh, the whole party, or do we need to rely on the leader or the personality? Because the culture, culture, it's it's people, and it's it's not mechanism, bureaucracy mechanism. It's people, first of all, as uh, as have mentioned Minister on his morning speech. Yes, first the first and the second. It's uh, chicken and egg. Without people, remember I have mentioned new dissidents, as I call them. Without them, there nothing can happen. Without us, who try to somehow move forward, nothing will change. But we need to understand that we cannot limit ourselves through from the state and we can do something we can have our own projects we will look for money from different sources and we will create great poetry it cannot be like this it will be like it was uh, that's the hypothesis on which uh, cultural not production was working in 19th and early 2000s so we need to build green bureaucratic structures it seems to me that uh, somebody switched off the microphone. Uh, I have such an assumption that uh, irritates uh, lots of activists in uh, actors in culture. I, uh, they say that if to build uh, bureaucracy, bureaucracy structures is an uh, extremely cre big creative challenge and intellectual challenge. On the one hand, uh, and it's definitely not less than creation of something significant as a movie, for instance. Uh, it's on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's also a challenge that requires huge willpower. So, shortly speaking, I encourage that uh, some kind of song of uh, and son of a bureaucrat. Uh, so bureaucracy work is extremely important, extremely interesting, and uh, extremely uh, tense in intellectual and willpower sense. And that's how you need to treat it in uh, this moment in history. I want to engage Tatiana here because when we say the EU, we mean bureaucracy. If we may say bureaucracy, we mean the EU in good sense. Not the European Solidarity, the EU, European Union. Tatiana is here from the European Union, not from European Solidarity. So, how can it correlate? It can it be correlated? So, the the culture that is the antonym of bureaucracy and boredom and methodology, how it can be all combined? I cannot say. Uh, anything else for, but um, support this last statement. There is no bureaucracy vacuum. We either have the Soviet model of bureaucracy or some more adjusted way uh, of, of suggested mechanism adjusted to modern realities with some bureaucracy rules. And if it is suggested, there is often a vacuum for this, and this is needed. And if it is suggested that it can be taken and can, can be used as a model, then it is taken. For example, how are the rules of municipal funds of culture change from uh, Ukrainian Cultural Foundation's rules? The model is replicated on local and all the other levels. The same is for other institutions. If we create that uh, act regulation, it can be replicated. But if there are, when there are rules, it does not mean which host, how hostile authors are. It's more difficult to uh, go against them. Uh, and that's how difficult for them to act in the conditions of old bureaucracy and old changes and old amendments. That's why when we have this planned work of writing down all those uh, additions and uh, signatures, annexes and so on, this is this field of war that will uh, help to win 
this more general ideological war, in fact. And without it, we cannot survive, without, we cannot be, and we can have as many personal stories as we can, but when we talk about the institution that started as a portfolio of Yulia, yes, it was as a statute at some moment, two building in which we have uh, equipment and when the several thousands of people are sitting and all those millions are implemented in those processes throughout the whole Ukraine. This transition, yes, it was because of personality that uh, society pushed um, to the sur pushed onto the surface and gave uh, desire to fight more in other plant in other scales. But this field of rules and procedures that has been created cannot be pushed uh, on the surface because it's already part of the body of the country and it is much more difficult to find uh, to fight with this than with uh, separately taken Yulia Fadyev. Such leaders are not created by the environment. They are not left out because of the environment, but because of the bureaucracy. It's hard to not agree with everything mentioned. We need bureaucracy in the procedures, but let's say for the provisional Oleg Saman, who will be here tomorrow, I think these are very distant words, the words about something not very important, but we are currently discussing this state or municipal sphere, the network of the cultural institutions. The thing is that the processes and rules already in place that have been developed and improved, for some reason they don't guarantee that there will be no manipulation, that somebody can change them voluntarily by the people who are used to it. I will give you a very telling example. Several years ago, I met one mayor of a town, and he was very optimistic about the change uh, of the management of the Ministry of Culture, because you know about the problem that we had the same people working at the Ministry for decades, and there was stagnation. So that mayor supported the law about the change of management. And when I met him a little bit later, after the law was already put in place, he told me something which surprised me. He told me, why do we need this law when I cannot assign a person I want to be the, the theater manager. So they found a way uh, to put a person they wanted in that position. They found a way, for instance, if we speak about the supervisory board of the Ukrainian Cultural Foundation, that is something that we all overlooked because we thought the rules were created, the rules were in place, and uh, people uh, sacrificed their lives for that during Maidan. We all stood there to have the new rules created. The rules were created, the institution was set up, and accordingly everybody had to follow those rules. And then suddenly on the supervisory board we have two members from the civil society representing us. And those two members from the civil society, they are representatives of NGOs registered according to rules and procedures, according to effective Ukrainian legislation. Uh, they have codes of the type of economic activity, which was mentioned in the morning by the ministry. Uh, this code saying that they are doing, uh, their, that they are operating in the sphere of culture. So, what they did was they hacked the civil community. They said that NGOs, we don't know what they are doing. They are formal uh, organizations existing on papers only. And because of 
not transparent electronic voting it's our blame that we overlooked that we thought that everything was going to work according to the rules and procedures two people uh, mr soslensky and mr artemenko were elected to Luzov. i'm sorry uh, i made a mistake so they were elected members of the supervisory board how do we build these rules and procedures that I'm all for? And you know that is your NGOs or your initiatives or project that you represent. If you don't have rules and procedures established, you will not be able to operate. And if that applies to huge establishment, we definitely need those rules. So I think we need to have a leader during this transitional period, when we become an actual liberal state with developed good bureaucracy and technocracy, bureaucracy that will uh, help us uh, making life easier, to make our lives easier, like uh, the DIA application. The sad truth is that any system can be hacked and it's impossible to create an ideal law and there are two opposing forces the first one being trust and the notion of reputation i put them in in one place and the second thing is while you were speaking i remembered about my trip to the united states uh, to learn from the experience of american journalists we traveled to hampshire which had uh, four public uh, broadcaster channels they had four channels uh, that did fundraising and i asked uh, the owner of uh, that channel how he was able to get the license and he told me i submitted my application they did the calculations and i got my license I'm trying to translate into English uh, the National uh, Board of uh, Broadcasting, of TV and Radio Broadcasting, uh, and I told him, if there is some politician coming in and interfering, what do you do then? He told me, if uh, the people don't like what I broadcast and they consider this to be violation, the people go to the court. So the leverage in any case is the court and the judicial system is the most important reform for us. So we, while staying inside our bubble, don't think about it. But I'm just remembering because my sphere of interests lies somewhere in the sphere of policy and politics as well. Do you know that the competition for the head of the National Health Service in Ukraine has already failed five times? Uh, we haven't had uh, the anti-corruption prosecutor for more than a year. What we are discussing here is not solely the problem of cultural society. This is the problem of the state. We need to take a step back and uh, put it under the umbrella of a uh, the growing up problem of the country. Can we expand the limits that we are currently discussing? So I am following up to my next question. What I'm driving at is that we all exist inside our bubbles. It's comfortable to be inside that bubble. But when I start talking to uh, people working in culture, uh, it appears that everybody knows everybody so this uh, rule of five handshakes works the problem is that if you want to have a uh, transparent competition and transparent uh, selection procedures the problem is to find people uh, that don't know each other that they have that have expertise that are independent isn't that a problem i believe it is so maybe we should do something about this as well. We should enlarge the bubble in which we are living and spread this influence on the ministry so that a minister cannot decline coming to a meeting like that. Uh, can I respond to this? So I have a hypothesis here. 
when you uh, more or less described the situation in all the institutions and other systems, that's practically similar to what I was trying to say, that the problem exceeds the sphere of culture. So this the emanation of this problem looks like this, but I have another hypothesis in this connection. I haven't proven this hypothesis. This is just an observation that I'd like to share. I think that one of our interesting tasks is reconciliation uh, of the elites. It appears to me that intellectual and cultural elites exist separately and so do political and business elites the political and business elites are more or less connected cultural and intellectual elites also have some connection but there is no connection between the two groups so our task to a large degree uh, is to overcome this post-colonial state since political and business elites have to use some senses, sorry for using this often repeated term, but uh, so do the cultural and intellectual elites. Post-colonial people borrow those senses from the center. This used to be Moscow, then later London and New York. They are uh, metropolis uh, par excellence in a broader sense. So this is a way to refer to a metropolis. We are overlooking the senses that are being created here. We are trying to borrow from senses developed in metropolis. That is why the environments uh, like the one we represent, the cultural and intellectual environment and space, are trying to create their own senses without uh, resources and without political representation because of lack of this connection that I mentioned earlier. And now uh, the optimistic element. COVID was very helpful, has been very helpful and remains so. It brought the situation back to the national level. Many people from business and political cir circles realize that they cannot solve their problems on a level uh, that exceeds the national. So if something happens uh, to you, it may happen that you cannot leave the country. So you will have to stay within your country, which will have to ensure that you survive. So your country has to produce the senses that you use in order to live and operate. And uh, what I'm observing here that over the past several years, uh, the spaces are becoming closer to each other and uh, they are uh, feeling more respectful of each other. I'm speaking more about the business elites. Many of them have switched to Ukrainian on Facebook over the past year. We in Ukraine uh, watch Facebook closely as a source of symptoms and very many people have switched to Ukrainian on Facebook. I think this is uh, an attempt to look for something valuable and interesting inside your own country. And as Michael Hauer recently told during the roundtable discussion discuss, uh, organized by the Ukrainian Institute, that is transplanting the values from the metropolis to your own center, to your own town. And this is a very healthy process, which we have the duty to maintain. And we also need to take steps forward in the direction of those circles that are open to be our interlocutors. We, ne we don't have to be defensive. We shouldn't constantly accuse somebody else it's one of our survival strategies to demonstrate that uh, cross that we are all bearing so we should probably 
change the approach and one of the things that was mentioned during one of the panels is that we should use um, a simpler language to discuss important things. We all use jargon, which we believe to be the best language in the world. This is a generalization, but I'm relying on my abstract experience here. We need to learn to speak the language of the people that we talk to. Tatiana, so coming back to the universality of this problem, I wouldn't call culture a universal sphere. I think culture is unique because money is used in this sphere differently, unlike healthcare or politics. Here we have an interested community able to generate counter messages. Uh, we are able to have a consolidated position and protect new institutions. Ukrainian patients, uh, unfortunately, for some, uh, except for some organizations, patients, doctors have their specific interests. I'm not going to touch upon uh, judges and the judicial sphere. So again, culture is the sphere of sense generating and it's very, very important that we don't lose in this sector and that uh, we don't give away our positions. So these hanged up situations uh, should be resolved. We need to try to approach the bureaucracy on different levels municipal, local, etc., so that we find any potential solutions. But we have to continue doing that. That's the obvious thing that makes culture different from other spheres. I would like to confirm, um, to prove this hypothesis of yours, that the main challenge for the entire state and all the spheres, not just for culture, is the judicial reform. But we have to look at the things that we can influence as citizens, where we have the time so that we can spend uh, some of uh, our life on, and where we don't have the time available. If we can, uh, for instance, uh, spend some of our time by taking to the streets and protest for the judicial reform, then we have to do it. Not all of us can constantly do that. Be and if we only use this tool, it means that uh, once uh, we've taken to the streets, we shouldn't come back to our homes because we have many more problems, not just the judicial reform. I think it's a very important aspect that we need to touch upon. And it doesn't mean that if we in our professional life don't deal with this problem, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing something in the sphere where we are working, where we are experts. So my optimism currently lies in the following dimension. When the capable, intellectual, young and active and liberal elite and that elite are you because political elites in our country at present are random people. Business people are not random. Political elites are random. If you are in that pool, then you are a member of the political elite. When you leave that pool, as I did, you are no longer considered political elite. So I'm speaking from my own experience. I'm already political, secondhand or vintage. This is all metaphorical, of course, you understand. Uh, people say that uh, there shouldn't be jokes at congresses. It shouldn't be funny. I believe that we are capable of coming together 
and articulating the things that we need and the things that I haven't reflected upon that I but I'd like to stress on criticizing the government is a natural thing to do uh, it's the thing typical for everywhere we shouldn't be playing with the government we shouldn't be servient in the sphere of culture this has always been the problem so when we can openly and clearly articulate our problems and our demands the task of the government is to hear us this is how the ecosystem works or shall we only hear their demands we are equal partners in this these people are managers so i'm urging you when we are ready to articulate our demands for the change of the model change of the legal framework we have all agreed here today that our framework is archaic and we realize that we need to update it and change it but i want to discuss it together with you on saturday at 4 p.m at uh, lviv city hall this is one separate a very large topic we need to interact with the government with the authorities until the moment they go mad then we need uh, to throw them away but undoubtedly interaction with the government is necessary we shouldn't constantly be pointing fingers at them just during some uh, congresses we shouldn't be throwing away the government or rather replacing uh, the government uh, we have some 10 minutes left and i'd like to have some five minutes to have a cup of coffee so does anyone have any questions Yes, we do have a question. Uh, a man in the mask. You have already asked a question during the previous panel. So can we, as a moderator, I have the right to decide who asks the question. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. I, I'd like to... Uh, asking the question already asked by Vadim, but I'd like to specify it. So the question is, is our cultural ecosystem big enough, dear panelists, and do we have enough trust, uh, capacity, and reliability for us uh, to let in new actors? Or is our ecosystem closed and aggressively toxic? Thank you. Our system is not closed, but it's encapsulated. We ourselves would like for the system to be more open. We just don't know how to find the instruments and the universal language which we can speak with the members of other bubbles because the business community is also closed they speak their language we speak our language politicians have their own language i don't know what other communities do we have so practically we are all atomized our society is atomized we get together based on joint interests uh, common problems situationally is our environment toxic as toxic as any other environment it's not more toxic than others it's not poisonous for sure we have quite enough open-minded people in our in my environment that are ready to listen that can communicate the skills of communication and having a dialect were lost during the soviet times soviet times were the times of declarations and doctrines so it was enough for us to have the 30 years of our independence to realize uh, the importance of dialect that's why we are open we are looking for these tools of this uh, common universal language mentioned by Olesa and undoubtedly our ecosystem is currently rather closed and we need to open it we already have the desire to make it more open but uh, probably we don't have the necessary skills 
I have a feeling that our system is not toxic and it doesn't have competition. There are many niches inside our system that are still vacant. In subsectors, uh, there are still very many opportunities uh, for people to realize themselves. Not because uh, these people are pulled out of the environment, but because we lack a professional offer, a well-communicated professional offer or a product. The second question is, how do we define uh, the ecosystem of a culture? Do we take into account small local museums? Or are we speaking solely about centralized uh, cultural institutions that we can hear about on TV. I have a short remark, a, a short answer. Uh, is our bubble big enough? That depends on the resources that we are having. And here I'd like to draw your attention to the fact how cultural environment, which is an interlocutor to any member of the parliament, this uh, environment is much more complicated for interaction than, uh, let's say, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. So you, as a government figure, you have to deal with people who are public speakers by profession. And it's very easy uh, to fall into this trap when you respond to emotional things and not the important things. And that is why even the best uh, government figures uh, don't stand the test of time and it creates this impression of toxicity. But this is not toxicity, it's the nature of this environment. We still have time for one more question. It's not a question but a remark. If we are speaking about the ecosystem which is not limited by uh, the borders of one lake, it's uh, wider and I'm very grateful to you for reminding us about the attempt to raid at the National uh, Health Service of Ukraine. So we started 2021 without a strategy. Our strategy ended with 2020. So the processes are very similar. I don't know what the code of nation is, but apparently there should be some corporate code of uh, state governance. If we speak about the newly designed institutions created to meet uh, the demand of the public that are uh, open and transparent, or do we speak about some sacred uh, authorities and governments? So uh, the manifesto of culture actors will be presented on Saturday, and we have a similar document created in the system of healthcare. And why I wanted to make this remark, because the processes in uh, the two of our spheres are very similar and everything happens at the expense of people who already know something. They are not representing the government. They are already vintage, but they already have this necessary expertise. And what I would like to suggest is for us to leave the bubbles and to see that the problems we are discussing is not the problem of the institution of or a sphere, it's just a universal problem of our country. So let's exchange the experience. So thank you for your remark. Uh, I gave people, uh, I would give people five minutes of a break before we start the next lecture. Thank you, Ira Olesa Tanya. Thank you to our audience. Not even many people left the room. So in five minutes, we are continuing with the lecture. Thank you.
dear friends, I invite everybody to go back. We have to start our next lecture. I would like to say a few words about the lecturer Andrian Ivakhev, who is the professor of Vermont University of the uh, in the USA. I'm trying to find a place where a projector is not uh, blinding me. And he is right now in Vermont, and he is waiting for connection through Zoom. But he uh, has recorded the election earlier, so it was easier to prepare the, uh, tr the interpreting. The lecture is going to be in English, but you can use uh, interpreters if there is a need. Uh, Mr. Ivakhev is a theoret theoretician of culture and eco-philosopher, so this is um, combination of philosophy, media, culture, and all his activity is evolving around such topics. Apart from the fact that he is um, lecturing in Vermont University, he is also uh, uh, teaching in the uh, School of Environment and Resources of Rubenstein, and he's the head of Ecoculture Lab, Lab uh, the organization that works on cooperation with eco-activists, artists interested in eco-topics uh, and wider uh, environment. Among his most uh, recent book that was published in 2018 was called uh, Anthropocenic Darkly uh, in Turbulent Times. As you see from the topic of the lecture, it's going to be similar to the topic of that book, but um, Andrian uh, has plans for working on the next project connected with the uh, research of uh, Chernobyl, uh, um, Chernobyl zone, and maybe as um, uh, another uh, an, another peculiarity, um, Andrian is very famous in uh, Ukrainian environment because he has Ukrainian roots. Uh, but he is also well known in uh, underground music environment of Ukraine in Ukraine because he is a founder and a soloist and the author of the group Vapnyake. I don't know, maybe some of you have uh, ever heard this. They uh, work in a very specific genre, ethno, psycho, folk, trash, uh, garage. So that's how they uh, define their genre. But I'm not going to uh, take my more of your time. I'm inviting you to listen to the lecture. Later we are going to um, meet Andrian through Zoom and there will be a possibility to communicate with him. Hello, everybody. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers, specifically Durana Rybczynska, uh, for invitation to share my thoughts on the topic of Anthropocene and the uh, stage of the future. Culture in the time many now call the Anthropocene is to peer into a crystal ball swirling with foggy uncertainties. This is not unlike a visit to the planet Solaris, the strange subject object of Stanislav Lem and Andrei Tarkovsky's imaginations, literary and cinematic. We cannot describe it without describing ourselves and our collective condition a condition of doubt, anxiety, guilt, and paralysis, tinged with utopian aspirations and dystopian fears, and seen through a parallax of vision in which the present moment intersects with geological time, the modern era throws itself open to the poker-faced immensity of the cosmos, and one's own vulner vulnerability is measured against that of others more or much less fortunate. If culture today has become mediatized, globalized, yet echo-chambered, anesthetized, yet hyper-articulate, and variously weaponized toward uncertain ends, what will culture be tomorrow? Which culture 
and whose culture. In the thick atmosphere of this new planetary configuration, the planet Anthropocene, we are yet to find if the air will be breathable. This talk will probe some of the challenges of prognosticating a culture for and beyond the Anthropocene. I begin with a few epigraphs that you can read to yourselves. Part 1, Anthropocene. The Anthropocene narrative should by now be somewhat familiar. Its four main variations date it back either to the beginnings of widespread agriculture, deforestation, rice cultivation, and stock raising, the demographic collapse across the Americas resulting from the encounter of Eurasian biocultural invaders, humans, animals, plants, germs, diseases, and the indigenous biocultural systems of these continents and resulting in rapid reforestation, dramatically subsuming carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Thirdly, the steam engine and the onset of the Industrial Revolution. Or, and probably most popularly now, the great acceleration of the mid-20th century with its atom bombs, petrochemicals, fertilizers, plastics, and all the layers of novel substances that accompanied these. The term Anthropocene is contentious in that it suggests that all of humanity shares responsibility for this epoch, when in fact, it's only a single variant of humanity, modern industrial capitalism, that's been responsible for both of the main markers for the beginning of the Anthropocene, the Industrial Revolution, and the Great Acceleration. But the term has caught on and it's what we have. Another pitfall of considering it our current epoch is that this suggests humans will be around for that epoch, but all it means is that human activities will have started it. They will have been responsible for the geological marker it leaves behind. We have no idea where it will go or who or what will come with it. The Anthropocene is in this sense what Peter Brannan, Earl Ellis, and others have called an event. To make progress in dealing with it, we have both to name it and to understand it correctly. The Anthropocene and the anthropogenically induced climate change, that's one of its distinguishing features, is something new on the human horizon, but also something that we're entering into at various rates with unclear boundary and transition markers. In this sense, we can give it the murkier name of a zone. How we respond to this zone that opens up before us and how we choose to make sense of it is a central question for humanity. Literature provides various options for making sense of it. For instance, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is certainly an option and one that's been entertained from various perspectives. Unlike Frankenstein's creation, climate change was unintentional and unexpected. In this sense, it's more like an encounter with an alien, something unexpected, unwanted, mysterious, at least initially, and at the same time vast, or what Timothy Morton calls massively distributed. Unlike any alien, however, climate change gives us an option of recognizing this alien as our alien. 
our child. At the same time, it raises question about exactly whose child it is and whose it isn't, and about who is child and who is parent. So what can be helpful for us is to find an analogy with something else that's unexpected, mysterious, at least initially, massively distributed, and with variable options for ownership, affiliation, and distance. Stanislav Lem's 1962 novel Solaris is about the human encounter with a planet covered in an ocean of gelatinous plasma, which appears to act as if it were sentient. Earth scientists attempt to interpret its actions and to communicate with it, but are unable to find any consensus on what the actions mean. Much of the book describes the various epistemological, scientific, philosophical, and cognitive efforts to make sense of this entity, this new being on the horizon of humanity. Lem wrote that the peculiarity of Solaris's activities seems to suggest that we observe a kind of rational activity, but the meaning of this seemingly rational activity of the Solarian ocean is beyond the reach of human beings. But Solaris is active, not passive, and among its own actions is to create materializations from its human visitors' memories. These materializations are traumatic and psychologically consuming. They become objectified ghosts from the Solarian visitors' own pasts that come back to haunt them and that they must learn to somehow live with and account for. It's this moral dilemma that Tarkovsky emphasized emphasized in his cinematic adaptation and that I wish to emphasize today. In all of this, the story serves as a metaphor for anything that is larger than us, that we are confronting for the first time, and that doesn't bring with it a self-evident instruction manual. Its significance is, in some sense, undecidable without asking about the significance of us who encounter it. Such a thing is anthropogenically induced climate change and its carrier, the Anthropocene. How we deal with it is very much a factor of how we make sense of it, as our creation, our Frankenstein monster, our alien, our child, our planet, even as it raises questions about who we are and thereby becomes our distorting mirror. But what's at the center of this zone? What traumatic kernel can be found at the eye of this hurricane? Part two. In the Strugatsky brothers novella, Roadside Picnic, the basis for Tarkovsky's later film, Stalker, the zone, or rather a series of zones, was created by alien visitors who are never seen. We just have to deal with the impacts of what they've left behind. In Tarkovsky's adaptation, the film, Stalker, the impacts create a zone of mystery, which elicits apocalyptic anxieties, but also hopes sometimes mundane ones, and sometimes millenarian hopes. This mixture of anxiety, risk, mystery, and vague hope is something I wish to suggest comes to us in the zone of Anthropocenic climate change. Stalker, as is well known, became an important template for interpreting the zone of estrangement or alienation created in the wake of the Chernobyl accident. And it is this resonance that stays with us today in the creation of multiple zones of estrangement, perhaps not as total, only partial, but an estrangement nonetheless, in the wake of technological and climate-induced disasters. A number of environmental writers have written about eco-anxiety, ecological grief, environmental melancholia, eco-sickness, and the like. 
just five years ago, Ian Kaplan first articulated climate trauma as a form of pre-traumatic stress syndrome, an immobilizing anticipatory anxiety about the future. As Jiwa Woodbury writes, climate trauma is an ever-present existential threat with a bevy of constant cognitive reminders, melting ice caps, eroding shorelines, waves of homeless refugees, the ravaging storms, floods, and fires broadcast into our homes 24-7, and the constant roll call of disappearing species, vanishing rainforests, and dying coral reefs. What's significant here is that we are not just talking about people worrying over something that hasn't happened or something they've seen in movies. We're talking about real suffering that's already happened, that's happening now, and that will continue to happen as things get worse, which we know from scientific projections they will. When suffering is pre-planned, when we know it's happening, when it's part of the calculus of risks and supposed benefits of certain activities, then it is a form of sacrifice. If the Anthropocene is defined by fossil fuel civilization, then we need to recognize that this civilization has been the most productive and at the same time the most destructive in human history. It's produced enormous abundance at the cost of health risks, large-scale disruption of ecosystems, And now a globally changing climate with potentially suicidal risks to humans and to nature. Risks that are unequally distributed across the cultural and ecological fabric of the world. I'll show that again. It's the geography of anticipated risk due to climate change as opposed to historical carbon consumption. A geography that looks a little bit like this. The risk today, as Australian eco-philosopher Glenn Albrecht puts it, is of an unraveling of the established patterns and regularities of Holocene phenology, followed by a new abnormal characterized by uncertainty, unpredictability, genuine chaos and relentless change, earth distress, human distress. What, wait, what awaits us in the coming decades is the largest explosion of human suffering this planet has yet seen, an explosion to which the COVID-19 pandemic is barely a premonition, a quiet precursor. In this sense, the zone may not be a zone separated from us, such as the 30 kilometer exclusion zone around a place like Chernobyl or the recently rebuilt sarcophagus that protects us from disaster and spills. It may be more the other way around. The zone is us, humans transforming the surface of the earth on a scale that's geological. or flipped around somewhat, the zone of comfort we are leaving is the Holocene, the bubble of reality or safety zone that has been shaped around human activities over the last 12,000 years or so, which in fact provided the conditions for everything we know as civilization and which we today know are 
at extremely high risk of being destabilized. The emotional space-time of climate trauma consists of zones that are entered at different rates depending on our positioning. You can think of this as an, a reverse explosion. There is the pre-traumatic zone. For those who have managed to shelter themselves so far, the becoming traumatic zone for those who face loss of shelter and bearings in a readily imaginable, almost here future. The already traumatized zone for refugees seeking shelter from wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, rising seas, and wars over land, water, and other climate affected conditions. And the continuously traumatized continuously post-traumatic zone where we find indigenous and colonized populations for whom climate change is continuous with centuries of world destroying identity rupturing trauma. These layers are interdependent and how we engage with them will dictate how successfully we might navigate through the zone, assuming there may be a beyond to it. The paradigm case in trauma studies is the Holocaust, which Shoshana Fellman and Dory Laub consider an event without witness, not just because the perpetrators destroyed much of the evidence of what they did, but because the victims had no appropriate frame of reference to account for it at the time. Ecological trauma is about the witnessing of a catastrophe that's not yet occurred, or that has occurred in isolated instances of a broader, slower, and more cataclysmic unfolding that may or may not ever transpire in its complete form. Eco-catastrophe is a trauma whose perpetrators and victims are ill-defined and whose nature is often delayed, mediatized, spread via images and narratives rather than from direct experience. Awareness of the possibility of ecological collapse doesn't hit you like an oncoming car. Such awareness gathers slowly, accumulating evidence like clouds rolling in the background of our awareness until something tips us over the edge, taking us out of the familiar phase space of everyday awareness into a less familiar one one that recognizes its utter insecurity and vulnerability. Part three. What in the midst of this unraveling is the role of culture and whose culture? Let us consider that culture is what makes us human. We whose sociality and creativity enables us to survive and flourish in the face of long odds, even as it sets us up within in-groups opposed to out-groups competing for land and resources in a shrinking world, we must find a way to expand our in-group to include the entire planet, shedding our culture in effect for a culture that is unbounded a culture that harbors the experiments of novel multi-species communities. To navigate this mysterious zone into which we descend will require an exercise of creativity unlike any we've seen before. Creativity learned from patterns and practices found in the world around us some of them observed and known by long-standing cultures, others of them gleaned through new tools of measurement and observation, all of them explored with the humble curiosity of someone descending onto a new planet and eager to learn the rules of respectful engagement that have evolved over periods longer than the brief interlude of the Holocene, yet respectful of that epoch nonetheless. If the Anthropocene is a triggering event, then what follows it is yet to be determined. Some have proposed a symbiocene, 
or an ecozoic, an era marked by symbiotic and mutually enhancing relationships encompassing humans in multi-species ecological communities. One start toward a symbiocene would be to begin with creative, ecologically appropriate reparations for that which is lost, buried rivers, wetlands, and other ecologically necessary landforms, lost species for which we must now find replacements and new relationships with precariously existing cohabitants of our planet, lost eco-social communities, some of which can nevertheless be revived in new arrangements, bleached coral reefs and other ecosystemic impairments for which we can replace novel ecologically appropriate formations. The list of tasks is, of course, a much longer one. I've been showing you the work of ecological artist and sculptor Jason DeCare Taylor, whose works displayed at the bottom of the ocean suggest a humanity beneath the waves of a changing climate, changing climate, a humanity sleepwalking toward disaster, a humanity beset by uncertainty and resignation, caught on life rafts and sunk beneath the waves, but also a humanity willing to give itself to become the coral basis for new life. His underwater sculptures, composed of pH neutral materials, are aesthetically pleasing objects that double as artificial reefs intended to sustain and proliferate the life of the organisms that are losing their habitus as humans reduce coral reefs dramatically around the planet. They are therefore an instance of human art collaborating with non-human art art in the sense of practical skill, whether that be the skill of creative reappropriation of objects or the skill that it takes to root in and grow on such objects. Any desirable form of human coexistence with, with the earth will in the future require experimental forms of mutual accommodation and collaboration between and across disciplines, between and across species. This work called Vicissitudes is located off the coast of Grenada, an island of which the vast majority of inhabitants, human inhabitants, are descended from slaves stolen from West Africa and brought across the Atlantic. Some of them died on the way, some were thrown off the slave ships and buried beneath the ocean. Some survived. David Carazza writes that by creating a work of art, which literally becomes part of a living thing, the coral reef, Taylor taps into a rich thematic vein for thinking about the slave trade. He takes figures that in one sense represent death and turns them into the medium for new life with the process that enacts violence on their bodies, producing an afterlife in vibrant color. This work called Anthropocene off the coast of Mexico depicts the decomposing carcass of industrial civilization in one of its most personal forms, the Volkswagen. It's in this spirit of squeezing a multi-species afterlife from the life of the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene event that is required for a future culture of the post-Anthropocene, the symbiocene. I'll end with a few quotes from African philosopher Achille Mbembe, who last year in the midst of the COVID pandemic and the George Floyd protests that tore across the United States and several other countries racked by the unrepaired legacy of slavery, wrote of the universal right to breathe. COVID-19, he wrote, has exposed the extent to which we humans are not the only inhabitants of the earth, nor are we set above other beings. 
we are crisscrossed by fundamental interactions with microbes and viruses and all sorts of vegetal, mineral, and organic forces. More accurately, we are partly composed of these other beings, but they also decompose and recompose us. They make and unmake us, starting with our bodies, our environments, and our ways of living and dying. If indeed COVID-19 is the spectacular expression of the planetary impasse in which humanity finds itself today, then it is a matter of no less than reconstructing a habitable earth to give all of us the breath of life. Humankind and biosphere are one. Are we capable of rediscovering that each of us belongs to the same species, that we have an indivisible bond with all life? This brings me back to the idea cited earlier of creation being a creation of time. Mbembe is referring here to Martinican philosopher and psychiatrist Franz Fanon's notion that colonization involves a negation of time. From the colonial point of view, natives were not simply people without a past and without history. They were people radically located outside of time Europe had the monopoly on that essential human quality we call the disposition toward the future, and the capacity for futurity was the monopoly of Europe. This quality had to be brought to the natives from outside as a magnanimous gift of civilization, a benevolent gift that absolved colonialism of its plunder and crimes. So the colonial framework of predetermination, decolonization opposed and opposes the framework of possibility, the possibility of a different type of being, a different type of time, a different type of creation, different forms of life, a different humanity, the possibility of reconstituting the human after humanism's complicity with colonial racism. In an eco-cultural perspective, this applies not only to colonized peoples, but to a colonized earth, to a colonialism applied at the scale of the earth, to life itself, an earth conceived as without time, on which humanity imposes its own time and exercises its own agency. But it turns out that earth has its own time, many times, some of them extending far beyond the human in both directions, to the deep past, and to the mysterious and open future, and most certainly extending beyond the colonial human, the Anthropos, as it has imagined itself to be, conquering Earth and other others over the past several centuries. In some of these earthly times, humans constitute a mere episode, and European colonial humans an even much smaller episode Decolonization in this sense requires finding new and different forms of life in which the earth itself, a living earth with, with its own time and its own possibilities, intermingle with humans, not only in the colonial template, but, a, but with a humanity open to multiple futurities and multiple ancestralities, ancestralities, all of them mixed with many non-humans in changing relationships, contracts, alliances, and formations. Mbembe writes, if we must together walk anew the paths of humanity in companionship with all species, then it is perhaps necessary to begin by recognizing that at bottom there is no world or place where we are totally at home masters of the premises, what is proper always arises at the same time as what is foreign. The task ahead is to find ourselves among the multitudes of a world that is not our own, and certainly not ours to own, but that calls upon us to join it, to recognize it, to discover its difference from us, a world, or rather a zone, that is full of its own kind of life, that opens out to the world's alterity, its foreignness, 
a foreignness we can never fully see, understand, or even imagine, a world that's much larger than what our elusive humanity can ever encompass. To create the future is to create a time that is no longer ours, that never has been ours, a time to which we might nevertheless contribute if we give of ourselves to it. Or else we can, as Pedro Marzorati suggests, walk blindly forward in our somnolent arrogance and go down with the tide. That is the choice before us. Thank you, Yaku. Can we hope for Zoom connection? We have a chance to ask questions to the author. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you as well. Uh, I will start from the fact that the day of catastrophe is finished with some kind of technological catastrophe. We had uh, really uh, terrible incidents of your speech and the picture, but I have a chance for future that when this lecture will, is published on YouTube channel of the Congress, everything will be okay there and those who did not hear or maybe did not uh, connect uh, image and text could do this later. But now I can we have a chance to ask, ask a question to Andrian or we can we can share our uh, our questions. First of all, we are very grateful for about this colonial, post-colonial prospect. I don't know how much do you follow or if you follow discussions in this sphere, I mean ecological sphere in Ukraine, but it seems to me that this is this prospect of post-colonial ecological one is very weak uh, in our country. So do you see possibilities to develop this prospect? of ecological thinking in Ukraine. And if you see this, then how can how it can be involved? I would like to see a, a prospect, but I'm not sure how good it is. And I'm pretty sure that it will come to that at some point, but I don't know how. Uh, we will be. We would like to see more humanitarian discussion uh, towards Anthropocene and ecological climate climate polit policy and other things. I understand that in Ukraine we they have their own their their own things, and that's why for me they are connected with the uh, world affairs, affairs of politics, the media, culture and ecology. But it's difficult for me to uh, answer the question how or when we, we will have in Ukraine such a discussion as in other uh, places. Thank you. Uh, do we have somebody else who would like to join with the comment or question? Hello, my name is Mariana Levoitska. I am the historian, art historian, and I have one question and one remark. Was first of all, is remark to Zuriana's word. Uh, don't you think that 
uh, that issue of ecological conscious, issue of Anthropocene, uh, basically on uh, suburbs in Ukraine. Uh, and that is the consequence of the fact that we still haven't had this in our mind of our artistic activists, intellectuals, is decolonization. So we are more uh, dealing with decolonization in traditional sense, and we cannot uh, cannot see this eco perspective. So it's a consequence. Do you think like this as well? Do you agree with this or not? And the other thing is just clarification. Can you please? Uh, uh, clarify, uh, can you please mention once again those authors of those art objects at the bottom of the sea, because it, it, we couldn't see it properly. Thank you for such a question. I will start from the last question, that's what you have seen at the bottom of the ocean, that's Jason the Care Taylor. You can find his sculptures on internet. On the internet, I think that it's called underwatersculptures.org or .com. His sculptures are in different places around the world. So all picture, all. Uh, statues um, in the bottom of the ocean, all, all pictures with those ocean um, statues were of, of his creation. Another question is about decolonization. It's true that Ukraine has its own process of decolonization, but on the other hand, Ukraine uh, is a world. It is obviously part of our world. Even Ukrainians know where, you, where is Ukraine. That's something new. Maybe ten years ago it was not like that. But I think that the processes that are happening, political processes or, or cultural, these are the same processes that take place in different countries of of Europe or colon of colon countries of colonized world and in the United States and Canada and around the whole world. So So I would rather say that the process is of decolonization of Ukrainian processes. They have their own processes are not the same as in the other countries, but it's, uh, these are the same processes. It's obvious that the Soviet Union left its, left its footprints, deep footprints. That we do not have here in the Western world, but still there are, di there are different parallels. Thank you. Do you have more questions or comments? You're welcome. Good evening. My name is Matro. You were talking about sleepwalkers. Uh, how is this in English? Uh, oh, sorry. Human sleepwalkers. Sleepwalkers, yes, those who walk when they dream. When And one last question, last question for today. In Ukraine this year, we have had lots of talks about Chernobyl. There, it was an anniversary of this tragedy. There were several interesting intellectual platforms, artistic platforms, on which when we tried to 
differently look at the, the uh, Chernobyl in our culture, and this discussion is on a new level has just started in Ukraine, and I'm very happy about that. I'm very happy that we have those first initiatives and first attempts. Maybe you know Serhii Plohi uh, book dedicated to Chernobyl. I understand that it is a like, topic of a separate lecture, and I know that you are also uh, interested in this topic right now. So how would you define this task that is in front of Ukrainian culture in the sphere of Chernobyl. What do we still need to do in the nearest time? Or how do we need to move in uh, making ourselves um, more aware of this topic? That's a difficult question. It seems to me that in Ukraine we already have the history of uh, this is the history of uh, defining Chernobyl issue, but that history is was may, was maybe developed on the national level, and st we still have problem how to connect it with the world level. So Chernobyl catastrophe is not a single catastrophe ecological ecological type but also it is an important one and it is a an important historical moment to realize certain relations between technologies people uh, state and p ecology planet this is also connection with geological time. Radioactive belongs to those components which, maybe I will say it in English, один з основних елементів визначення антропоцену. Тобто, so Anthropocene, if to understand that it is um, time, space, and it includes certain understanding of technological possibility to make a change on the planet that longevity of which is beyond, much beyond longevity of the civilization, continuity of civilization. I can talk a lot about it, but but we are going to have separate talk on, on this topic and I hope that it will be in the nearest future and we will be able to greet, to welcome you in Lviv. At least I really hope that you will come to Lviv as a researcher and I announce that this, um, we definitely have this wish from Andrians and our site and I hope that we will be able to implement this and uh, we uh, will be able to get back to this topic and not only to this one. Maybe somebody else has formed some kind of question or comment. If no, then, uh, Andrian, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude. There is a question. Hello, my question is about Chernobyl also. I was just thinking about this phenomenon and there's lots of people are have been talking about this right now that it's like the best ecological situation there because uh, during a long time there was no uh, effect of uh, people who were living there and active there. So it seems to me that this phenomenon is pretty interesting that because of such Anthropocene catastrophe influence of this Anthropocene basically stopped. So I wanted to ask whether there are some other examples when because of non, uh, some man-made catastrophes, uh, a transformation happened in ecological sphere that led to not expected, unexpected positive effects from some site. That's an interesting question for me. Chernobyl zone is one um, is one zone is an example of zone 
which is around the whole world. Such, such zones are uh, everywhere in the world, which are caused by man-made catastrophes or military catastrophes that were closed for people. And after that being closed, they became more, you can say, more attractive for non-human nature. And there are lots of zones like lots of zones like this. I have shown some pictures from the USA. There are such zones in Hamford's nuclear west side in Colorado. There are in Arizona and also around the whole world we have similar zones. And for me Chernobyl zone is uh, pre premier example, the first example. The concept of concept of the zone that shows uh, relations of person uh, with this zone. So people left, nature came. But people know, uh, we, but we know why people left, not because they wanted to leave. And if you to take into account uh, this notion, then uh, we can under see the zone something like Anthropocene turned inside out. So basically, something uh, changed in a different way. And it's also already a lecture, becomes can become a lecture or a museum. So we have talked earlier today about the museum, about culture in the museum, uh, about cultural ecosystem. But if to take such exam examples of such zones as a Chernobyl zone, then it also becomes um, museum example, museum in the best sense of this world, not in the sense that uh, we just put something there that is not alive, but it's rather the most alive example of the Earth as a life system. That's also, it's easier for me to talk about this in English, but I hope that my opinion is somehow conveyed. Yes, of course, thank you. I invite uh, one, everyone once again to uh, treat it as the kind of advertisement when we have a possibility to talk in real, in real life. I would like to express my gratitude for the lecture because personally for me as curator of this day, uh, is uh, connected with the majority of uh, topics that we have been talking today during the whole day today and what we have started with when we talked about uh, catastrophe topos in uh, re modern culture and this prospect that you built for us in your lecture uh, it seems uh, it's like a pretty new prospect, a pretty new view on a culture, a human culture, much wider prospect which gives us push to different opinions, different ideas that can appear after this Congress. So, Andrian, thank you so much. Again, so again sorry for catastrophic, uh, uh, for the catastrophe that um, uh, accompanied your lecture, but we will try to change it. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. See you soon.